So I think maybe we'll get started. We'll start on time and uh, we'll see how long this takes. So welcome everybody uh, to our very first members meeting via Zoom webinar. Uh, we ask that you be patient with us. Uh, we did have a practice session, but that doesn't mean that it'll necessarily run smoothly, um, but we will do our best. Um, the, as one of you pointed out earlier, uh, we do not have your pictures. And if you want to speak at the bottom of your screen, if you move your um, cursor down, you'll see a little hand down there. Um, if at some point you want to say something, you can raise your hand. It'll be noted here and we will address your hand when there's a, a moment that we can do that. Otherwise, uh, certainly feel free to ask your questions in the chat uh, column. Or there is also, for instance, in the Q&A, uh, Troy, thank you, <laughs> answered no in the Q&A uh, column that you can click on and ask questions there as well. So we will be monitoring both. This is the agenda for the today. Um, we're gonna have our welcome, which we're doing now. Uh, Paul uh, will hopefully have a photo montage that he can present um, if there were photos this past month that were um, available for him to put that together with. Paul Heath will then provide some information about outreach up opportunities and his poem contribution to Food for the Soul. Dave will give his usual what's up for the month and I'll give my usual news from the board. Um, Pat Kelly will be giving uh, his observer handbook presentation regarding limiting visual magnitude. And notice I changed it for you, Pat. Um, Wayne um, will hopefully be around to provide the librarian report. And then Blair and Jerry will give uh, their second part of, of their three part series, Anatomy of an Imaging System. What toys do you need? Uh, Paul Heath will then give a really cool uh, thing on, on making stars. And then Paul Gray will give our special presentation regarding variable stars, observing and reporting. So that's what we're up to today. So I'm going to hand it over to, um, oh, one other thing I wanted to do before I hand it over to Paul is for those of you folk who are out there in uh, the audience who are not members of RASP, I would like to encourage you to do so. There are several benefits of, of uh, joining, uh, such as you get a copy of the Observer's Handbook every year when you're a member. You can subscribe to the journal, uh, be it hard copy like this one uh, or electronic. And you also get the, cent or the uh, National RASP Sky News uh, which is a, an incredible magazine. So um, not to mention you get access to our observatory and to our library uh, and to our Nova Notes, which is our center's uh, newsletter. So on that, that note... That was Sky and Telescope you put up. Pardon me? That was Sky and Telescope you showed. Oh, shoot. You're right. <laughs> ah. Hertz saw the letter. Jerry, can you bring that in from the other room, please? Sky News. Thank you. There we go. Try that one. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. I have all our magazines on our coffee table, and so to have it them together. Okay, on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Paul Heath and to um gotta find you and so paul you're up okay uh for the outreach opportunities since we're all segregated and isolated and everything else uh what we're we've got some with national as well as we're doing a few ourselves uh some online outreach uh, uh i don't know how uh, blair what Blair called it uh, was uh, visual observing uh, online. So there'll be a few observing, Paul. Visual observing? Virtual observing. Virtual, okay, virtual observing. So that'll be, uh, that'll be online. Uh, check the website uh, for any of the uh, times that that might be posted, both on the national and on our local site. So that's about the, the outreach activities. Um, at the, I, 
my uh, food for the soul is sort of related to our isolation uh, uh, situation. And uh, I don't know if uh, uh, many of you remember what happened after 9-11. The skies vanished. Uh, it was empty of planes and, and that. So I, I've sort of gone a little bit on that. So the last albatross. There are no drifting lines upon the, the air. The skies devoid now of souls. Blue, unmarred by the rushing roar. All trails of smoke have dissolved away. Clouds alone adrift upon the cooling air. With no drifting lines upon the air, the skies are orphaned, free of souls. Silence fills the blue above. Wings have folded, no longer the blue to glide within. Clouds alone adrift upon the cooling air. No flashing lights chase in circles now. Below the stars, the air has stilled. Souls seek not for cloud-lined trails. Abandon the guiding stars, drift now alone. Clouds alone adrift upon the cooling air. Then from out the empty blue with long and sweeping turns, it slowly climbs to meet the drifting clouds, to lift above the land and away over the seas. Aloft, alone among the clouds, Last albatross upon, upon the cooling air drifts away. That last albatross was a cargo plane leaving Halifax at two weeks after the cancellation of international flights. Hey, Judy. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next up, um, we have Dave Chapman. And I will share my screen with you there, Dave. Hello, um, maybe I need to share my screen. Yep, that, that would uh, be the better. I don't, I don't need your screen, thank you. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, did a little um, rehearsal of this the other day, so we'll see if this works. I'm gonna share my screen and see if I can uh, put up my PowerPoint presentation and uh, also see the links from the PowerPoint. Um, so after we're all done, if you want to go to the RESC Halifax webpage, the What's Up for April is already there as a PDF file. Of course, you don't have the benefit of my voice, but the information's there and the links on the PDF file actually work. So if you want to follow up some of the links after the fact, if you go to our webpage and look at the PDF file for What's Up, you will be able to follow those links. So here goes. I'm going to try to share my screen. And first of all, I'm going to go to my PowerPoint and I'm going to go into screen mode. How are we doing? Great. Everybody see that okay? Yes? Yeah, it looks good, Dave. Great. Okay. So this is the What's Up for April. And uh, so what we've started doing is uh, we used to do What's Up, you know, based on the meeting date. But now what we're doing is we're just doing it for the month. And, um, and sometimes the meeting takes place partway through the month, but it's, it's just easier to do it for the month and, 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 and post it on April 1st for those people who don't get to the meeting. Uh, and I use my source for this is mainly the Observer's Handbook and I use Sky Safari quite a bit um, to make the graphics and to look up some data and so on. Um, by the way, I'm not, uh, I don't work for Sky Safari, but for those that are interested in Sky Safari as an app, uh, I believe that uh, Sky Safari, some elements of it might be on sale at the moment. You might want to check that out this weekend if you're ever interested in buying it. I think it's great. Um, you can do all kinds of things on it, including uh, running your telescope if, if you're into that. Okay, so let's move along. First of all, we'll talk about the sun this month. And uh, you know what's really weird about this? It's not getting the feedback of the audience, not seeing the audience. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I hope everybody can see this. Uh, you're quite uh, welcome to ask questions. Uh, maybe, maybe you could wait to the end. Maybe that would work out the best. So 
So here we have the data in numerical form and in graphical form. Uh, so here we are, it's a few days into April. Um, so what you can see is now we're well past uh, the equinox. So there's more dusk and nighttime than there is daytime. So the sun's setting around, uh, you know, 20 to eight now, and it doesn't get, it, it doesn't get dark astronomically speaking till about 9.30. We have uh, under eight hours of darkness before dawn starts again around 5.15. Um, and solar noon is at 12.20. Uh, so there's a bunch of different reasons uh, why that is. Actually, that's a mistake, I think. That should be 1.20 because we're in daylight saving time now. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. But we're getting, uh, for the gardeners out there, we're getting um, over 12 hours of dark of sunlight. And by the end of the month, we're gonna get 14. So that's great for plants, growing plants. They love at least 10 hours of sunlight. So that's why you're seeing things growing now. By the end of the month, which is May, nearly May 1st, um, we're going to have only about six hours of darkness and 14 hours of sunlight. And you can see the, the graphic there shows, uh, shows that. So if you follow this link down here, it says YouTube RASC Halifax. There's a little movie there that goes through the whole year and animates these uh, pie charts that I made. Um, if you're interested in following that up, I'm, I'm not going to do that now, but if you want to follow up with that later, uh, you can do that. What I will do is go up here and look up today's solar activity. I checked it out a few minutes ago. I don't think it's changed much since then. Let's see if this works. Okay, are we seeing space weather live? Everyone? Anyone? No, no space weather. Yeah. Uh, I um, think you may have to flip over to the uh, it, your web browser to see it. Um, let me think now. Uh, do I have to share my screen separately now? Uh, the okay, hang on. Is, Wait a no, second. Rick, if, you, if you just escape full screen mode in your presentation. Okay. So, so I have to do this. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry about this, folks. Um, I thought we had this all figured out. Okay, how about that? Can we see it now? Space weather? No? Yes, no? No. Okay, so I'll tell you what, uh, we're not gonna do that. I'm gonna have to figure <laughs> that out offline and fix it for next time. Um, hey, what you did is you shared your software, your PowerPoint, rather than sharing your desktop when you selected your share at the beginning. Ah, okay. Stop share. Let me try that again. No, share screen. Desktop. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm glad somebody knows how to do this. That's true, but I still think your PowerPoint is full screen. Okay, so here's here's my PowerPoint, right? Yes? No? Yeah, yeah. Now let's try this. Are we seeing Space Weather Live? You are indeed. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paul, for uh, straightening me out. Okay, after all that, there's really nothing to look at. <laughs> there's like one sunspot group here, 2759 uh, in white light. And then if we go over to some strange wavelength, which looks like um, aquamarine wavelength, whatever that works out to an angstroms, you can see there's some kind of activity there around that sunspot group that you can see over here. So. Not much to look at unless you have a specially filtered telescope. However, because of the, uh, maybe somebody can correct me on this. Because it's a high latitude spot, it means it's a spot coming in the upcoming solar cycle. Can anyone verify that? That would make sense because they start off well away from the equator and as the yeah. cycle progresses, they get closer to the equator. So the bad news is we're near a solar minimum. The good news is we're seeing the beginning of the next solar cycle. Pretty cool. Okay, thank you very much for that. And, uh, and now we're looking at the moon, right? Yes? Yes. 
Okay, so um, April 1st was first quarter, and uh, of course it was, uh, it was very uh, overcast and windy. Um, so we've, we missed first quarter. Full moon is coming up on April 7th, which is eh, Tuesday. And it's the birds laying eggs moon. And there will, because it's near perigee, there will be large tides to follow. Okay. Um, Blair, you're there. Blair, Blair. Hello, Blair. Yes, I'm here, Dave. Uh, is this a good time to maybe tell people what we're going to do uh, when it's next clear? Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Dave and I have been chatting after we did the uh, first virtual observing uh, session uh, what have we been last week. Uh, and we thought what we do is try and do a lunar observing session. Um, of course, it requires some clear skies and uh, reasonable hours. And what I will do is uh, set the telescope up again in the driveway. Uh, and with uh, Mr. Chapman's uh, exceptional MC skills, we will uh, give a high magnification tour of uh, our nearest neighbor. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with that uh, for a moment last time where we got onto the moon and we were looking for the crater Newcomb, which has a Canadian connection and we we had fun looking for that and finding it. So uh, when, we when we figure out when that's going to be, what evening that's going to be, what I'm going to do is I'll go in and figure out where the Terminator is on the moon and I will pick out a number of objects that are in uh, Explore the Moon and we can kind of focus on, on those and try to find them. Um, does that sound reasonable, Blair? Yeah, that sounds perfect. And uh, the only issue we will have uh, is uh, we've probably got Sunday and part of the upcoming week uh, to do this. Otherwise, we may have to put it off till the next lunar cycle. The reason being that uh, tomorrow night, uh, at a reasonable hour. Um, I'm one of these foolish people that occasionally still has to call into work in the morning to pick stuff up and take home. Uh, the uh, moon won't make it up above my neighbor's house until about nine. Uh, oh, okay. And of course, as it gets uh, later and later in the month, that gets later and later before the moon crosses. Right. Okay, well, yeah, understood. Um, I don't think we sh will be spending more than about an hour or so, maybe maybe more, but uh, an hour should do it, you know, of observing, don't you think? I'm not too concerned with the amount of time the observing takes, it's just when it starts. So like then, I said, yeah. tomorrow okay. night we can probably start at about eight, uh, and then it's what, roughly 45, 50 minutes a night that uh, yeah. we yeah. go back, so we're okay. going It'll be quite late after a few more nights. Anyway, I guess we'll probably send that out on the list if we're doing it. And, uh, and by the way, uh, even though we're going to be looking at Explore the Moon objects, uh, nobody should get the idea that by participating in this, they're going to qualify for an observation for their Explore the Moon certificate. So just put that idea out of your head right now. Uh, this is just a fun thing. Uh, um, to, to get the earn the certificate, you have to use your, you've got to get your eyeball to the telescope and look at real photons, okay? So just yeah. clearing that up. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt there, Dave. Paul just uh, fired me a quick chat. Uh, his comment was, if it's later in the month and I can't see it at a reasonable hour, he can probably run it from his observatory. So one way or another, we should be able to get it. Well, once it gets the full moon, eh, yeah, um, once it gets past full moon, it's going to be rising pretty late. So hopefully we'll get it done sometime over the next uh, few days or a week anyway. Yeah, and okay, if not, great. we'll do it next month. So there's one more thing I'd like to do here, um, since it worked so well the last time, is I would like to go and I would like to go and get Curtis to help us pronounce the um, Mi'kmaq name for birds laying eggs moon. Let's try it. How we doing? 
Are we there? Can we see that? Hello? Yep, no problem. You just got to press play. Yeah, I just, I need feedback if people are seeing things, this is all. So it's okay if Judy has her mic on and tells me things. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. It's stuff to Here play. We go. There we go. Can the movie goes? Can the movie goes? Birds laying eggs moon. Comes from the word benat, to be laying eggs. Can the movie goes? Birds laying eggs moon. Thank you, Curtis. So, Dave, there was a question from one of our members who said, would it be possible to record your, the session that you and Blair are doing? He'd love to show it to his niece, but it'd be too late for her to actually attend. That we would, could, that we could be, do that. Yeah, we, that would be up to the person hosting it, I think. But uh, if Blair wants to do that, that's okay with me. I would certainly have no problem doing that, provided we let people know it's being recorded in the emails that we send out to invite them. Just as this session is being recorded as well. Yep. For educational purposes. Yes. Not to improve your customer satisfaction. <laughs> okay, so birds laying eggs moon. I don't know if anyone else noticed it, but I've got birds ga gathering stuff for nests around here. And uh, I actually talked to one person uh, who's a member. Uh, uh, and um, that individual told me they observed a nest in their vicinity and uh, so it is it's happening folks it's real so last quarter is on april 14th uh if you're a real keener that's when you can get up in the morning and look at the moon before you don't go to work or whatever it is you do in the morning uh, i used to observe quite a bit in the morning uh, i found it a nice time to be up and about but if you're trying to get those elusive um uh craters on the the western part of the hemisphere on the moon, uh, that's a good time to do it. Now, on April 15th and 16th, there's some interesting conjunctions in the sky. So for some time now, the three planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn have been in the morning sky just before dawn, and the moon will join them on the 15th and the 16th. Now we're talking about maybe getting up at five o'clock or something like that. Um, so, Anyway, you can get out and just enjoy them. Or if you're an astrophotographer, there's some wide field um, options there, opportunities to capture the moon with planets. Uh, I'll say more about the planets later. The new moon, the next new moon is April 22nd, and that will be Frog's Croaking Moon. And I'll talk about that, I guess, next month. And on April the 30th, the last day of the month, we have another first quarter. So that's interesting. And so we have two first quarters this month. And I just wanted to mention that that can happen because our months are longer than the lunar cycle, which is 29 and a half days. So our months are 30 and 31 days, except for February. So you can have these uh, instances where you get two phases in a month. And this is one of them, April 1st and April 30th. Okay, let's move on. So here's the uh, map of the moon that's in the Explore the Universe guide. Uh, it's a very compressed uh, list. Uh, Explore the moon has about 100 objects, but if you're doing Explore the Universe, which is what we recommend if you're just getting started, there are 12 craters, 12 fairly large craters, and 12 mare or lunar seas. Uh, some of these can actually be seen by eye, but um, binoculars will show all of them. So if you want to do your Explore the Universe program, you need to uh, observe half of each of those. So you need to observe six craters and six um, mare. Um, that's what the objective is. So my challenge to everybody out there is to observe three of these this month in binoculars. So if it's clear tomorrow night, and you get bored of listening to me and Blair, you could just step outside and view the moon for yourself. Okay. Planets this month. Okay, well, we just missed Venus in uh, Pleiades. Too bad. Uh, that was the big, the big event, and it was cloudy here. So I know some people out west saw it. Um, and uh, don't worry. We'll only have to wait for eight more years to see that again. <laughs> 
if you want to see that. So Mercury is in the dawn sky. Uh, it's very low. It's not a good apparition for us. Appar apparition, apparition for us. Uh, it's difficult with with different with if you have a low horizon and you're um, and you're keen, you might be able to find it with binoculars. Venus, of course, is a uh, still a br brilliant even uh, evening object, and I, I had it as a challenge to see it in the Pleiades. Uh, on the 27th, it's going to be its greatest illuminated extent, which means it'll be magnitude minus 4.7, the brightest it will be this year, at least this, this season, and it'll be a crescent phase. Now people say, well, how could it be brightest when it's only a crescent? Well, it's because it's a combination of factors, but it's getting closer to us. As it gets closer and closer to us, it becomes more and more a crescent, and it's closer to us, and it's also larger. So all those things combined, and you get, you get the most amount of light reflected from the sun. So uh, it still has some brightness to gain, and, and the, re the rest of this month, it's going to be still pretty bright. I should say that after that, uh, it's going to not take very long to plunge down towards the sun and uh, go into inferior conjunction. So that's, it's going to disappear by the end of May, I would say. It's going to be pretty hard to see Venus. And then it'll pop out into the morning sky. Mars is... Um, Bright, not, not crazy bright, but it's getting brighter. So over this month, it'll go from magnitude 0 0.8 to 0 0.5. Uh, and it has a conjunction with Saturn and Jupiter. Um, I, I mentioned that, uh, I think. Anyway, I forget the date. I didn't put the date here, but it was on the moon thing. Um, did, I forgot to put the date, sorry. Um, I'm going to have to look that up. Or maybe, maybe Pat Kelly could look up there. The, the conjunction of the Saturn while we're talking. Um, what was I going to say about Mars? Oh yes, Mars. So Mars is headed for a um, an opposition, a, a reasonably close opposition for us in October when it's going to be super bright, super close, and situated in a good place in the sky to observe. The last opposition was brighter and closer, but it was so low in the sky that it was hard to actually see very much. This opposition is going to be in October. It's going to be higher in the sky, and, and it's going to be a, a better, a better view. So we're going to be working towards that through the summer. Pat Kelly is actually going to give a talk uh, at Nova East about Mars, a little bit about its science, and a little bit how how to observe it. So for those going to Nova East, um, did Pat was Pat still looking up that conjunction time date? You got it. I just grabbed my handbook. Yep. Okay, May, we'll move on and Pat can interrupt when he gets the date, but there is a nice conjunction with Saturn and Mars. Uh, let me, this allows me to talk about uh, the comet, Comet Atlas, C2009Y4. This was discovered in late December and it's coming on strong. At the time, it didn't seem like it was going to amount to much, but it has taken on a bit of activity. Now they're suggesting it might actually become naked eye by the end of May. So here I have a plot of the, um, the path of the comet in the sky centered on the middle of this month. So it's still well up in the sky at dusk. Uh, it's hanging around um, Camelopardalis, Perseus. Um, uh, there's not many bright stars to, to find it, but um, right now it's about magnitude 8 or 8.5. It may get brighter. I, I don't know of anyone who found it in binoculars yet. Uh, you should be able to in a dark sky. In the city, not so much. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to need a telescope. And if it does get bright, even if it gets bright, I would recommend people leave the city to look at this comet because when Hayakutaki was here, and it was an amazing comet back in 1996, uh, it looked amazing from a dark sky. But when you went back into the city, it just looked like a little smudge in the sky because of the light pollution. So the people who didn't leave the city totally missed out. So that's what we're, um, that's what we're looking for. We're following that comet. 
I had an interesting uh, conversation with uh, a very anxious woman on Twitter. She was very concerned about it because of course all the conspiracy theorists are saying that this is gonna crash into earth and all this kind of nonsense. Um, anyway, I had an interesting conversation. Um, don't worry folks, it's not coming near earth. Hey Pat, you got that conjunction between Mars and Saturn yet? Yes, well, I, I, I was looking in the handbook and couldn't find it. And then I realized the reason for it was it was March 31st. Uh, okay, I don't follow that. Has it already well, taken place? Okay. More on the comet. Um, there's a little uh, uh, animated GIF that John Reed took. He, he took 42 exposures with Ralph, the robotic telescope, one night and made this little video of the comet. Now, you, you have to understand this is a time lapse. It's not actually moving this fast against the stars when you look at it. So the, this thing is cycling every few seconds and it represents three hours of movement. So you have to imagine this is how it's moving over a, you know, a good part of the night, but it, it's reasonably bright in the telescope and it's got a nice little tail. So it's really worth, if you've got a telescope, you should really make the effort to look for it. Moving on, it's springtime. The Explorer of the Universe spring constellations are the same as last month. Ursa, Ma Ursa Minor, very easy to find near Polaris. Ursa Major, if you can't find Ursa Major, find another hobby. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bootes, the Herdsman, Leo. Virgo and uh, Libra, a little bit harder to find. Um, I'm just gonna use my cursor. Is my cursor working? No, I can't. Oh, there it is. So to find Arcturus, you take the, here's the, here's the Big Dipper, you take the, handle the Big Dipper and you, and you follow the arc to Arcturus. Oh my goodness, what did it do? Here we go. You follow the arc to Arcturus and you keep on going and you find Spica, which is down here behind these words. Uh, it's a fairly bright star. Uh, the, the rest of the stars in Virgo are a little bit harder to find, especially from the city, but you should be able to find Spica anyway. And Libra is over here. Uh, it's got a couple of, um, couple of brightish stars, Zubanel Ganubi and Zubanel Shamali. Libra used to be the part of Scorpius, and the claws of Scorpius. And I think these are like the upper claw and the lower claw or something like that. So as terms of ranking of brightness, uh, Arcturus is the third brightest in the sky, speak of 14th Regulus, 22, Regulus and Denebola are over here in Leo. Polaris is not, not anywhere near the brightest star in the sky, like some people say. It's number 48. And Denebola and the others are, they just don't, you know, they just don't end up in that list at all. Uh, in terms of deep sky objects, well, the spring is full of deep sky objects. Um, unfortunately, most of them are galaxies. And for that, you really need a telescope. So this is, a, this is galaxy season, springtime is galaxy season. And we saw a bunch of those at our virtual observing session, but for the binocular observer, there's a, only a handful of, sub, of objects worth looking for. Uh, the beehive in Cancer uh, is a nice little open cluster of stars. Try to get that as soon as it gets dark because it's setting in the west. And then over here in, uh, below the uh, Big Dipper in this area is the Coma Cluster. It's a beautiful um, cluster of stars. None of them are super bright, but together they make a very nice view. There's a photograph here of the Coma Cluster. It includes a double star bonus. 17 Coma, I think, is a double star in Explore the Universe. There is a little double star. And then finally, Messier 5 is a globular cluster, which you can find. So those are only the only three uh, springtime um, deep sky objects for exploring the universe. So the challenge is to go out and try to find the coma cluster with your binoculars. And you, with binoculars, you know, you kind of find the Big Dipper, find Arcturus, and kind of like just kind of look around here. Um, most binoculars have about a five degree field of view. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Also coming from Leo, 
uh, up past Leo's bum here, go up there. So it's kind of between Regulus, Spica, Arcturus, and the Big Dipper, kind of in that area. Now, Betelgeuse. We were very excited watching Betelgeuse uh, fade around Christmas time and beyond. Now, a lot of people lost interest in it because it's getting bright again. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna blow up, I guess, and become a supernova like everybody hoped. But here's some data points. And what I've done here is kind of interesting. The data points I'm showing here from the American Association of Variable Star Observers, but I've only included the Canadians in here. So this is only Canadians. And the green, the or, the, the green boxes are, um, they're kind of, um, how should I put this, sort of scientific measurements in the visual spectrum using instrumentation attached to the computer. And the circles are visual estimates by observers using their eyes. And uh, over here, uh, there's a couple of, um, there's some crosses here, which I think are me and Dave Lane. So my, my observations are in there somewhere and Dave Lane's observations are in there somewhere, the, the brown crosses. So if you don't look too closely, you can see that I agree with everybody else or everyone else agreed with me, something like that. I'm not very good at this stuff, but uh, at least I'm kind of in the pack. So I think it's still worth keeping an eye on Betelgeuse, although I think it's harder and harder to see it because it's uh, setting. So there's gonna be a, a period of time where we won't be able to look at it. Anyway, that kind of closes the book on Betelgeuse, I guess, unless Paul has some, uh, Paul Gray has something else he wants to say. No, he's wagging his head. Yeah. I am going to talk about it later on. And oh, you are? Okay. An example, but nothing, nothing extensive, nothing at all okay. extensive. Thing. All right. Well, I, I'm sorry to uh, steal your thunder there. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation of What's Up for this month. Any questions? Wow, we've got a quiet group. Yeah, we'll just uh, give them a few moments to access their Q&A and type in their, uh, or the chat and ask questions, uh, Dave. They can, they can even raise their hands. They and can do that too. I'm not well, sure everyone knows how yet, but for all those listening, if you um, move your mouse at the bottom of your screen, there is a spot that you should be able to find your Q&As to, to uh, do those and in your attendee list for the viewers out there, you should be able to hover over yourself and see a spot where you can click on raise hand. Uh, one of our members says, just applause. He's clapping. <laughs> good I'm going to I'm, I'm put someone on the spot. I'm gonna uh -oh. see who, who have we got here? Uh, uh, let's see now, who are we going to ask? You know what? I see this name here, John Nangreaves. He was a member and he's, he went off and, and he's living in PEI. John, Raise your hand and say something. Say hi, at least. Come on, man. Oh, so shy. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, a shout out to John. I, I'm glad he's tuning in. He, uh, he, his hands up now, Dave. Well, hands up. Hands up. And Sherman Williams got his hand up. Uh, just a second here now. Okay. Maybe. Well, we'll go to John first. Oops. Okay. Maybe I can do it. And there is a question. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fabian is asking, is it possible to photograph Atlas with an ED80TCF? I have no friggin' idea what that is. Can he explain it in English? <laughs> and uh, Blair, can you or Jerry or anyone else that's involved in astro imaging, perhaps Paul, answer this yeah. one? Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, it's a nice small refractor for Dave's benefit. Uh, but uh, the short answer is yes, it is possible to image virtually anything with that telescope. Uh, it'll be a dot, but you'll get an image of it. Okay, okay, good. Thanks for explaining that. Are you gonna, John, is, are you gonna get let John speak? I'm asking for IT support. Um, he's coming in a moment. There he is. Okay, the two hands. How do you answer them, please? John first. 
John, can you say something? Just see if we can hear you. All right, no. Okay, so. We may not have given them that capability. We may. Okay. Okay, when, then they should put their questions in chats. Correct. Sorry about that, John and, and um, Sherman, but you're going to have to put your... Uh, you, can, you can talk to them through chat. Yeah, we know that. Um, but um, so yeah, we, we unfortunately, uh, with the next webinar, we'll make sure that uh, we have that capability to have members John's actually ask questions live. John says there's no KB there, and I don't know what he means by KB. What's KB? No kilobytes? I don't know. No craft dinner? No, um, I don't know. I don't know what John's asking. Uh, keyboard. <laughs> no keyboard. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so how is he typing into the chat without a keyboard? <laughs> I have no idea. You know what? I think we should move on. If anybody has any questions later, and uh, okay. Thank I, you. We'll, we'll, I guess we can always uh, try to field them later. But, but the technology is failing us here. Yeah, Dave? so you, you can still ask your questions through um, chat. Through chat, or if they go to the scroll to the bottom of their screen or just put their mouse down there, they'll also see Q&A that they can type their questions into. Well, I see something here uh, from Karen. Karen's asking, is the moon near Jupiter and Saturn on the 15th? And I think I think I said yes. That's uh, on the 15th and 16th. Uh, I think the 15th is closer to Jupiter and on the 16th it's closer to Saturn. Uh, it's the 14th and the 15th. Oh. Boy. How did I get that wrong? <laughs> Too many uh, dates. Are we talking universal time or something like that? Um, okay. Saturn north, two degrees north of the moon on the 15th. Mars, two degrees of north of the moon on the 16th. And Jupiter, two degrees north of the moon on the 14th. Now those are, universe, those are universal times. Anyway, it, the moon's going to be around those parts between the 14th and the 16th. Um, all right. Yeah, I, I'd like to say uh, hello to the little four-year-old for Joan Cook. Uh, little four-year-old said he wanted to say hi to us. I'll say hi back. Okay. Hi, glad he's with us. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on yeah. then. I'm, I'm done for now, and I'm going to mute myself. Okay, um, Paul, um, do we have a, a photo montage that I forgot to uh, cue? You do have one? All right, then I shall let you share your screen and you can take over. Should be coming through now. Does you guys see it, panelists? Yep, no problem. All right. I'll hit the first button and just let it roll. Maybe. So anyway, I left them run for 10 seconds each. There's probably 15 photos in here, a couple minutes. I don't know. I want to just leave it run through. I don't want to narrate it, but. People can comment or ask questions through the usual channels. Full screen, don't want to be.
Paul, well, that's run, running through there. I just thought I'd answer Sherman. Uh, he asked if he was in contact. And Sherman, yes, you are. I'm in full screen mode. I'm trying to figure out how I can get out so I can see the chat and stuff at the same time. That's why I figured I'd answer it. I guess while we're watching this, we'll have to wish a very happy birthday to Carly Orbinson, whose Sita. birthday is today. Happy birthday, Carly. Carl. Hi, it's Dave here again. Uh, I just figured it out. Uh, Pat said, yeah, the conjunction between Mars and Saturn was on March 31st, which was at the end of last month. And that was just me not deleting that line out of the WhatsApp from last month. Uh, I apologize for that, um, but uh, that kind of thing can happen. So, so that cleared up that mystery. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. And and it looks like we need to wish another happy birthday out there to Brad Filippone. Happy birthday. Obviously, the weather's been getting better. There's a lot more images and sketches going on. We've had a pretty good month in the last week and a half. Like Paul was saying, the skies have been amazingly transparent, and it is clear. Also, a lot more people are home and able to take pictures. Yeah, it's been nice to not have to get up as early in the morning. So the work to the commute to work is really hard now. The five minutes to get out of bed and get downstairs. <laughs> Getting dressed for it is quick too. Who gets dressed for work anymore? <laughs> the we stop. Yeah, I have I have a new rule. It's it's not afternoon until I've had my shower. <laughs> which sometimes means days don't have afternoons. There's such a wonderful collection this month. Yeah, it must be galaxy season, eh? All those galaxies in there. All right, so that's the slideshow for this month. Uh, I guess that's everything for me for now, so I can stop my share. Can you all see that? Just, just one moment, Judy. Um, yep. I just wanted, I was just looking at the chat window. Uh, uh, Carl uh, Jorgensen, or Jorgensen from the Montreal Center has yeah. joined our meeting. So uh, just, just wanted to say hi to Carl and thanks for tuning in. Yes, we wished him happy birthday. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I missed that. Yeah, okay. no, just as the meeting started, Dave, I posted the links to the REC National Facebook page in case there's other members who wanted to pop in on us. Yeah. Obviously, I need to pay more attention. <laughs> okay, well, uh, well, every month we uh, try and present news from the board, and it isn't just from our board necessarily. Um, try and present news from the national body as well. Uh, for those of you that, want, that don't know how to find us, there's our uh, web address there. You just have to type in healthfacts.rest.ca and you'll be able to find us, no problem. Um, Again, I encourage folks that aren't members of RASH to please join us. There are several perks to uh, joining us. Uh, we had a practice session uh, that was something someone mentioned that earlier. Um, and during that practice session, it was suggested that perhaps I should change the title of this. There really shouldn't be updates from the board. So I said, I went first to them and then thought about it after we left the practice session and I decided, you know, he's right. So now we're going to call it COVID updates for the board. In other words, we're going to be presenting things from national and from local that uh, will hopefully keep you inspired and involved uh, in the coming month while we're all homebound. 
first and foremost, I guess, I think everyone knows by now that the uh, RASC GA this year has been canceled uh, due to the COVID-19. However, uh, on the 6th of June, which is the Saturday of uh, when this would have been held, there are going to be some special webinars, I believe, that, excuse me, uh, are going to be held from the Vancouver area. So we'll keep everyone posted as well national, I'm sure, as to when those will be occurring. So it's nice to know that we won't lose it completely. Uh, and as you are aware, we have access to Zoom uh, due to, in, well, <laughs> in whole by RASC. Uh, the national website is rask.ca. And when you log in, anyone logs in, this is the screen that they will see, although the COVID-19 update will certainly scroll across to other things. But you can see on the masthead the types of things that you can uh, find out about. Um, so if you click on the COVID-19, let's see if I can get my mouse up here. When you click on that, this is what, and this is for members, if you don't log in, this is what you will get. And for non-members, this is what you will get. You'll get that screen that has the menu items here along with uh, a calendar for the month. And please note that all times are in Eastern Daylight Time, which means you should consider that these are an hour early. Um, these are um, the COVID-19 updates that you see there, anyone can access. So the, the Homebound Astronomy, it's a class that are every uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you can see them here starting at 4.30 our time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, Chris Vaughn from Toronto Centre and Jenna Hines from National are the two hosts of that particular item. Uh, we've attended a couple and um, for the beginner uh, astronomer and for those that would like some familiarity with uh, Stellarium, it's, it's a great session to uh, participate in. The self-isolation party, the star parties are every other Wednesday and you can see it here in the star party on the upcoming one on April 8th and another one on the 22nd. Um, it's a webinar and it'll be on RASC YouTube as well. And, um, and also, where are we here? Yeah, the self isolation parties. Yes, that's 11.30 p.m. our time, not 10.30 of theirs. And then we have the speaker series. And this one's really exciting because there are um, three presentations that are being done, special presentations. Um, the Apollo 13, the flight that failed, is being um, addressed by Randy Etwood, who's a former executive director with the center. And then on April 24th, there's 30 years of the Hubble telescope that is being presented by Chris Gaynor, who is the current RASC president. So that's rather exciting. I put the May 8th presentation in gray only because it's not this month. Um, but something to look forward to is Canadian Women in Astronomy, and it's being presented by Heather Laird. So those are two very, or three very exciting series to uh, be involved in. Um, certainly, uh, th this week's sky, you'll see that little nice little thing there. It gives you exactly what it says. It's what's in the sky this coming week. Um, but also here from the e-reads, um, RASC has a national archive. Uh, and um, this is giving you access to several items, uh, documents, photos, books, um, history of RASC and history of the Observer's Handbook. Um, there's actually digital versions of the old ones from 1908 to 1989, which are rather cool to go in and see what they look like in their contents compared to what we have now. Um, and also there are three Observer Handbook history articles. And one of them was written by Dr. Bishop, uh, Roy Bishop, uh, entitled 100 Editions of the Observer's Handbook, and that article was written on obviously on the 100th anniversary of the production of the Observer's Handbook. And so this is a great segue to, from members only, and this is why you should become a member, is that there is uh, eight consecutive sessions, except for the holiday Monday of May, on how to use the Observer's Handbook. And it's being presented by uh, James Edgar, who's the current editor of the handbook, along with um, several of the contributors to the handbook. Um, during those eight sessions, we have two from Nova Scotia that are gonna be presenting. Um, one is Pat Kelly, and the other one is Dr. Roy Bishop. And there are two other gentlemen who are contributors as well, Bruce McCurdy and Alistair Ling, who will also be uh, presenting those. And that is something that members of you will have to register for, and it gives you the link there, as you can see. So 
just another perk of membership, right? So you've got to become a member. Um, thanks to National, our center has access to the National Zoom, and as a consequence, we've been able to do things such as what we're doing today. Um, if you have any questions about Halifax Center itself, that's the email address that you can access us, Halifax at rasp.ca. Otherwise, this is how we've been using, we'll be using actually, uh, our Zoom, uh, National Zoom account. We have two members meetings uh, coming up, one on May 2nd, another one June 13th that have already been uh, set up to go. We have three boards of directors meetings. We have uh, committee meetings specifically for Nova East, and we've, we will be determining some virtual observing sessions, such as the lunar observing session that hopefully will come up this coming week, some deep sky observing, and who knows, there may even be some astroimaging processing sessions that we can uh, set up as well. So we'll keep you posted. Heads up, for now, Nova East is progressing as planned. Um, we have our fingers crossed um, that we can go forward, but if not, we may be discussing other ways that we can present some of our guest speakers because it's really cool this year. We're really thrilled um, and thanks in very large part to Dave Chapman who acquired our speakers for us. We have a really exciting slate of speakers and topics. Um, and three of them I'd like to, to point out for now. One is Andrew Fizikas. I'm hoping I pronounced his last name right. Um, but uh, he's the night sky guy. And um, he will be presenting um, a session to us. And Dave, I forgot the title. It's about astronomy in the 20th century, I believe. The 21st century, rather, sorry. Yeah, it's something like amateur or backyard astronomy in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, we had we had a nice chat about this so it's a very he's got a very upbeat message he's he uh, uh, about you know what the opportunities are for backyard astronomy coming up and how we can keep people involved and find things to do and uh <clears throat> i i think it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, some people may know of him from the radio and television um and his wife is also, well, he, he's involved with Astronomers Without Borders. He's their communications manager. And his wife, turns out, is the temporary uh, executive director of Astronomers Without Borders. And so we've got a two for one because I've uh, asked her, and I've forgotten her name at the moment. I'm terribly sorry. Zoe Chi. Zoe Chi. Anyway, uh, she's going to give a little talk on Sunday morning about just basically uh, telling every, the participants about Astronomers Without Borders and, and what they're up to and how, how people can get involved if, if they want to. So, um, yeah, and I think, <laughs> I say this all the time about things I get involved in. I think it's the best one ever, the best program ever. But yeah, uh, why and, says, uh, I always say that about my last thing, so. <laughs> Well, it, it is very exciting because one of the things that, one of the goals when we set out to acquire speakers is to make sure there's a cross representation of male, female, and young. And I think this year uh, is really exceptional uh, in, in that regard. And especially when you note that we have two of our youth members, uh, Keegan Oikel and Fiona Morris, who are also presenting a session um, entitled The Next Generation. So we're really excited about that, uh, to have them uh, join us, um, uh, hopefully in person, but if not, perhaps we can arrange something uh, in virtual um, observing or virtual oh, session with them. They're both, uh, they're both attending this meeting. So uh, yep. I think they're both really, both of them are keen to actually be there. Yeah. Uh, yep. And one thing I wanna note is that registration is not open, nor will it open until we know for sure that everything is a go. Uh, we will keep people posted, but uh, everything on our website that you see there, novaeast.rast.ca, what is uh, current is labeled as 2020. Um, that's one of the things we've started to do so that people will know that what's there is current. Um, the, um, and the speakers, the speaker schedule, the schedule, and the speakers lists are all updated. So if you wanna see what the schedule is that we've set up, 
you can go to our site and look at what we've planned to uh, present on that weekend. And please note that there are also three items on the etiquette that have been updated that people should make note of. So for those uh, on the webinar who aren't members, um, I can't say enough, please come and join us. Uh, there are two ways, you can join online. Uh, first of all, go to our website, which is down here, halifax.rast.ca, and go into the um, menu item about us, and you will see a column entitled Becoming a Member. If you click on the blue word join, it'll bring you to the RASC national website, and you can join there. Whenever you join RASC, you are a national member. You then just have to choose your affiliation to Halifax or whatever other um, center you wish to be affiliated with. And the benefits of being a national entity is that should you decide to move to another province, all you have to do is go in and change your affiliation and you'll be affiliated with that center. If you prefer to do the uh, other way, which is a paper mail-in form and with a check or whatever, um, you can click on the word form and it'll bring you to the uh, form that you can print off, complete, and then mail in. Our next meeting um, is on May 2nd. Uh, it is going to be by webinar yet again, uh, starting at one o'clock. It'll be with Zoom and we'll have our, our usual um, entities in terms of our photo montage, what's up, food for the soul, news for the board, um, the observer's handbook presentation, as well as part three of the um, imaging system. And really excited about the fact that Phil Groff, the executive director from RASC, is going to be joining us virtually. We had hoped to have him here in person, but as you can all appreciate, that's not possible. But we still have him to address the, uh, the audience for us. So this is really exciting. We're really thrilled to have him. So we'll keep you posted on how that goes. Any questions? All right. Well, at least I should have a bit of practice with this because I've had to deliver my last three classes for my first year of astronomy class by recording them remotely here and uploading them to the DAL system, um, which is always good to learn how to know how to do that sort of stuff. So the handbook talk, uh, the section that I've chosen for uh, this meeting is the section on limiting visual magnitude, or as it's more usually referred to as simply LVM. And why do you want to know the limiting visual magnitude when you're out observing? Well, obviously, if you're looking for something that's really faint, uh, the clearer the sky is, the fainter you're going to be able to see. And being able to know what the limiting visual magnitude is gives you an idea before you actually start observing whether you're actually going to be able to see fainter objects and if you have a telescope, as I'll talk about later on, that you're, you're looking for objects of a particular brightness and the sky is really crappy, then you might know that you might want to stick to brighter objects with it. So that's sort of what the main reason you're going to do this uh, is for. And it also gives you a measure of both, not only how clear the sky is, but whether or not you have a lot of light pollution. And if you're in some parts of Canada, whether or not you have enough, a lot of Northern lights. And I remember one time, even from Nova Scotia, uh, looking through my telescope thinking that the sky was turning crappy and it's because I was looking through northern lights that were starting up and that's why I couldn't see uh, what I was looking for. So <clears throat> the section of the handbook uh, looks at has things for uh, for doing it visually and for doing it with your telescope. Visually it's centered around the area of the North Star and this is just basically a view of the North Star uh, for around this time of the year around 11 o'clock at night. Uh, we have the Big Dipper overhead. I'll show this uh, with a little bit easier to find a little bit later on. Um, so this is looking towards the north and I'm just going to sort of turn on the labels for the stars so that you can sort of see. Okay, maybe not. There we go. Let me back up one. Okay, so here we have uh, the stars that mark the Big Dipper up here at the top. Uh, Vega and Deneb, the two of the three stars in the Summer Triangle, are actually up now. You can actually sort of see them if you look towards the northeast, uh, which tells us that summer is on the way. And the winter stars are starting to set over in the west, and Capella is the really bright star over here. And here is Polaris, the North Star. And I'm just going to remove those so I can draw in a couple of lines. So the Big Dipper is the way that you find the North Star. So again, for those of you who may be new at it, the Big Dipper right now is right up overhead. 
So if you look more or less straight up, you'll see it. And the way that we find the Big Dipper is by using these stars starting from the handle and using these last two stars, which are the sort of pointer stars, and they will point you to the North Star. And it's a fairly easy uh, trip because the distance you want to travel along this line is about the same angle in the sky that the Big Dipper is long. So that's what tells you where to stop. And contrary to popular belief, uh, the North Star is a bright star, but it's nowhere near the brightest star in the nighttime sky. The key thing to note here is that the Little Dipper also is a constellation and it comes off of the North Star. So you notice that there's three stars in the handle and three stars in the bowl, just like there's in the Big Dipper. This line you, you want to keep in mind because depending on what time of the year you actually are looking for the North Star. As the Earth goes around the Sun, the entire sky appears to rotate around the North Star. So this time of the year, this line comes off to the right of the North Star. In six months time, it'll come off to the left. The reason you want to keep track of this line is because when we see in the diagram that's in the handbook, that line is in it. So it's sort of get you, help you orient yourself properly. So this is the chart that's in the section of the handbook on limiting visual magnitude. Um, as you can see, it's the area around the North Star, the North Star being the brightest one in here. The numbers are the magnitudes of the stars, and traditionally they leave out the decimal points so you don't confuse those with really faint stars. Uh, Paul probably talked about that a bit when he talks about variable stars. And again, if you're not familiar with the magnitude system in astronomy, it's probably the most screwed up measuring system you're ever going to come across because as the numbers get bigger, the object gets fainter. Whereas with every other type of thing, six degrees is hotter than two degrees, six kilograms is more than two kilograms. When you talk about star brightness, this is a 2.0 magnitude star and it's brighter than one that is six magnitude. Here's a little 6.1 over here. So the bigger the number is, the fainter the star. Here's the line that connects the North Star with the first star in the chain that makes the handle of the dipper. That's why I said you have to sort of make sure you get the orientation correct. And as you can see, there are stars on here going all the way down. The faintest one is magnitude 7.4, which is this one over here. If you can see that visually, um, you've got really big eyes or really good eyes. But for most people, uh, the easiest way to sort of get a rough idea is to use this sort of spiral or squished G shape over here that's near the North Star that starts at magnitude 4.2, and then goes down to 4.7, then down to 5.2, then to 5.6, then to 6.2. And with really, really, really clear skies and really good vision, there's one in here at 6.7. I've personally never seen that star. Well, let me, I should correct that. I have seen it in binoculars just to convince myself it was actually really there, but I've never actually been able to get down to that star looking with my actual eyes on a nice dark clear night. And make sure that your eyes are dark adapted. So you should do this after you've been outside for 10 or 15 minutes. Don't do it as soon as you come out. If you go outside and look around and you can't even see Polaris, uh, you know you're not gonna be doing any observing at all uh, that particular night. So why did they choose this area of the sky? Well, it's partly, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's always the same elevation up in the sky. So it doesn't move around the sky. So you're not looking first at it directly overhead part of the year and down near the horizon part of the year. It's sort of in a consistent location. There's no really bright stars there that are going to dazzle your night vision. There's no bright planets that pass anywhere near the North Star. Uh, so it gives you a good idea of what you're actually doing because it gives you a nice consistent spot on the sky. So that's how you do it visually. And normally what most people tend to do is record your observation at the start of your session. And that should give you an idea of just how faint you should be able to see actual objects. Now, if you can do this with your telescope or with your eyes, you should also be able to do this with your telescope. And of course, there's reasons why you want to do it with the telescope as well, because if you look for a really, really faint object, you're going to be using something other than your eyes. So if you're looking for galaxies or other really faint things like Pluto, for example, uh, you're never going to see Pluto with your eyes without any sort of optical equipment. So you can do this as well for a telescope. Now for a telescope, you're going to need some part of the sky where there's a fair number of stars. You want to have the stars over a nice wide range of magnitudes or brightnesses. 
so that if you have a really big telescope, you can see some, check out really, really faint stars and see how far you can go. You also want an area of the sky where it's up nice and high in the sky. So that, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later on. And you want an area where the stars are also spread enough far apart that you can actually easily identify them. And basically what you're looking for is an open cluster of stars that's fairly spread out. And the one that's actually been using, that's used in the handbook, is one that's in the southern sky. So here we have the winter constellations. I'm not going to bother putting the names on. This is Orion over here. Here we have Sirius, Procyon, Pollux and Castor, Capella is just off the top. And over here we have Leo the Lion with Regulus at the bottom. And in between the constellations of Gemini and Leo is a faint constellation called Cancer, the Crab, which is best known for this cluster here, M44, often called the Beehive Cluster. That's not the one they picked. The one they picked is in fact this one down here. This is M67, which is the other Messier object that's in Cancer. A lot of people forget that there's a second messy object in Cancer because the Beehive Cluster is a really, really nice object. And if you zoom in on it, uh, there's M67. And if we zoom in on that area a little bit, here we have Pollux and Castor. So here's Gemini. Here's M35, another nice open cluster. Here's the Beehive Cluster. Here's the constellation of Cancer. It really doesn't have a lot of bright stars in it. And in this particular program, even when you zoom in this far, it doesn't even feel that M67 is worth adding a label to it. So there's M67. So once you find M67, what part of, the, of this cluster are you looking for? And what does it actually look like? And how do you know you're actually going to be looking at the parts in the chart? Because you don't want to look at the very center where the stars are really closely packed. You want to look towards the out, outer edges of it. So this is a photograph of M67. Uh, and as you can see, it looks sort of like a shotgun blast on top of regular pattern of stars. So open clusters typically tend to be uh, fairly loose collections of stars. And the area that we're looking at is the northwestern part. So north and west, so this part of the cluster up here. And there's a couple, there's two sort of very easy to find patterns. At least they're easy to find for me because I spent some time looking at the diagram to try and come up with them. And if you look inside this circular area, you'll see that there's two actual patterns. One is this one here. So this little pattern here it looks sort of like a hockey stick. It's probably about as close to the Stanley Cup finals as we're going to get this year. And underneath the hockey stick, there's a little line of four stars right in a row. So I'm going to zoom in on the upper right part of this cluster. Now, I'll give you about 10 seconds to see if anybody can actually find the hockey stick and the little line of four stars. And if you can't find it, don't worry, I'm going to show it to you in just a second, but I thought at least give people a chance to sort of see exactly how they're doing. Okay, there's the circle. And there is the little hockey stick. And there's the little pattern of four lines. And if we zoom in even further, we can see them quite nicely. So this is about the area, the same area of the cluster that's actually in the chart that's in the actual handbook. So I'm gonna, uh, yeah. Is the star at the end of the hockey stick uh, on the right, is that a double star or just two stars that are visually? It's a double star when you zoom in close enough. But in the, in the early ones that are fairly wide field, they're actually, they, it looks like a single star. I think if I can, if I can back up here, if I can back up, back up, back up, back up. Yeah, so even though here you can see, you can see it's actually a double star, depending, I can see it as a double star on my computer, but if you, as you, as you sort of zoom in, it becomes more obvious it's a double star. So there it is here. And, there it is there. And, and when we look at the actual chart, uh, just go ahead here. You can see on the chart, it's actually a double star as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Jerry DeVoe is asking how much magnification this would be. So I guess the proper question is, is what would the field of view be of this chart so that uh, people would figure out what they need for an eyepiece uh, magnification with their telescope to get that field of view? Oh, funny you should ask, because that's actually in the handbook. Um, the chart is eight minutes. So about eight arc minutes. Eight arc minutes, and the moon is about 30, so it's about a third the mm -hmm. diameter of the moon. So this is still a fairly wide, wide field view that you're actually looking at. And you'll notice in this particular diagram that without actually cluttering it up with all the magnitudes, because that would just add even more confusion, what they've done is they've lettered the stars in order from the brightest one, which is star number capital A. So they go from capital A to capital Z. And then the last little bit are done from lowercase a to lowercase e. So there's big A, there's lowercase a there. So A is the brightest, B is the next brightest, which is over here. Big C is down here, and as you can see, they, the dots get smaller and smaller. There's D, and then in this case, there's no picker pattern to them. Uh, unlike the little spiral shape you have near the Big Dipper or the you have near Polaris, you basically have to sort of work your way from one to the other to the other to the other until you find one. In addition to this chart, there is a, there's also a table that shows you. It comes in. There we go. It gives you the actual visual magnitude of all of these stars. So star A here is starting off at magnitude 10.6. So we're already down to fairly, a relatively faint star. And as you can see, they go in sequence from magnitude 10 down to 11, down to 12, 13, 14, and so on. And if you have a really big telescope, uh, you may want to actually be able to go down to much dimmer stars. Or if you're using a telescope, where you're using either a camera or a CCD camera to take long exposures, you might also want to be able to see just how faint you can go. And as a result, this thing just keeps on going. So we're down to 18th magnitude, 19th magnitude. And when you get down to the lower case letters, you're down as far as 21 magnitude. And E is this little, little rascal right down here. So that's what the diagram is for. And uh, generally, if you pick a really clear night, so if you want to test your telescope, uh, make sure that you have a really dark sky. So do it visually first. Make sure you have a really good sky. Then test your telescope. For your telescope, you're only going to have to do this once. Uh, and you might want to do it with two or three different eyepieces with different magnifications just to sort of see how that changes things. Now, the chart that's in the handbook is designed for a telescope that has an even number of mirrors. So it sort of gives you a more or less a right side up image. Um, if you have a telescope with an odd number and your telescope also mirror flips things, there's two ways you can sort of do that. Uh, you can take the diagram that's already there and you can just simply photocopy it and do that with it, uh, which sort of works because a lot of the letters in, in the English language uh, are the same both ways. So A looks the same whether you flip it or not, M doesn't. Uh, but some like G and K don't quite do that. So the other option you have is use the second chart that's in the handbook, which is the exact same chart mirror image, but with the letters the right way around. So no matter whether you give your, your telescope you should mirror reverse view or not, you've got a chart that actually does that. The last thing that's sort of related to this issue is atmospheric extinction, uh, which at first glance sounds like what we were trying to do with the ozone layer, but it's a different phenomenon altogether. Uh, basically, as you're looking through this atmosphere, the more atmosphere you look through, the more likely there's going to be either dust or haze. And as a result, when you're looking straight overhead, you're going to get the best possible view of the sky. And as you get close to the horizon, things are going to get harder and harder to see because you're looking through more and more of the Earth's atmosphere. And there's a little table in the handbook that sort of shows that. And what I've done is I've turned it into a graphical form. And as you can see, from straight overhead to 52 degrees above the horizon, there's actually no real extinction because you're looking through a fairly small amount of air. That's one of the reasons why generally, if you're looking for faint objects, you want to look for them when they're as high in the sky as possible because you're going to have the least amount of murk to look through. 
When you go to the next range of angles down from 36 up to 52, there's a little bit of extinction there. It's only 0.1 magnitudes. And you'll notice that Polaris at 45 from our latitude is actually there. Now this can be a problem if, for example, you decide to go to, to the Caribbean for the winter where the north sky is down, low on, lower down in the sky, then if you can see visually down as far as magnitude six, you're gonna to have to back off a bit because of the fact that you're actually looking at it through a bit more murk. And you see the problem gets even worse because not only does the magnitude extinction get worse, you actually have to change your typeface to make it smaller so it actually fits between the lines. So from 36 degrees to 29 degrees of elevation, you're up to 0.2 magnitudes. The next range, which is from 29 to 24 degrees, you're up to 0.3 magnitudes. So now it's starting to become a significant issue, especially if you're looking for something that's right on the border of what your telescope is actually capable of seeing, or your eyes for that matter. Once you get down to between 20 and 24 degrees, it's up to 0.4. And then you have to shrink things again in terms of text, but from 18 degrees to 20 degrees, it's getting up to 0.5. So by the time you're within 20 degrees of the horizon, you've already lost a full half a magnitude over what you would normally be able to see. Now you would think that I'm just gonna to have to make smaller and smaller and smaller increments here. Fortunately, the section of the handbook is uh, very specific on the topic. If you're below 18 degrees, it's basically going to be greater than 0.5, but variable. <laughs> so it's going to be worse than half a magnitude, and the variability is going to be coming because when you look through that much atmosphere, you really have no idea what you're looking for. You might, for example, be getting light pollution off of the distance in one direction, but not in the other. You might be looking, for example, at an area that's got some smoke or other incoming cloud formations. But that's one of the reasons why when you're looking for anything, you want to make sure it's as high in the sky as possible. And if it gets close to being overhead, uh, that's going to be your preferred location for seeing things that are really, really at the limit for your telescope. And that's the end of my handbook talk. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try and answer them. So I think at this point I can just stop sharing and go back to Judy. Great. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, We'll just give it another moment here. Uh, should anyone want to ask questions? Um, just have a, I don't think Wayne has joined us yet. So I don't think we're gonna get a librarian's report today. Um, but other than to, to say that obviously, uh, the card is not being pushed out today. <laughs> um, and we are looking at, once we are able to get face to face, one of the things the board is looking into is, is uh, acquiring a new cart to put the books into but we'll keep everyone posted as that progresses and now Blair and Jerry um, anatomy of an imaging system what toys do you need part two take it away you announce that like it should be Tom and Jerry <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna change your name that'd be fine hey there we go uh, I'm assuming that beep was on your end? Uh, not mine. Oh, okay. hang on a sec. I forgot to mute mine when I was finished. Ah, okay. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to take a look at today is uh, the software end of things. And uh, I just wanted to give everybody a warning. This talk involves three computers, two network connections, and a telescope. So you can imagine how this is going to go. <laughs> Hopefully it will work out well. So I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen with the presentation. We'll go through the presentation first. And then after the presentation is done, uh, we'll move on to a, um, a bit of a demo of the system and then a Q&A if anyone's got some questions. So my first question is for the panelists there. Can you see the presentation okay? Yes, no problem. Yes. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so. The, uh, the talk today, as I said, uh, is the second part of the talk that uh, has been broken up into three sections. So Jerry's got the next one. Uh, and let's see here, there we go. What toys do you need? Uh, or sometimes translates as what toys are you allowed? <laughs> uh, in this case, we're gonna look at the software integration that goes into making a imaging system more usable. Uh, you do not need to use the software we're going to talk about today. 
uh, to do basic imaging, but, but to be able to do detailed imaging and more importantly, to be able to sit in a comfy chair in front of the TV and drink coffee while imaging, you will need some type of software to uh, let that happen. Uh, I, I saw Dave Lane is in the audience and there was a cartoon in the journal many years ago once Dave got his telescope uh, system up and running of Dave falling asleep in front of galaxies scrolling across the TV. I'm almost there. So as I said, we're gonna take a look at software integration and a little bit of a demo afterward. Now, obviously we're not gonna be able to image stars, uh, but uh, we can at least look at the uh, tree in my next door neighbor's backyard with a little luck. <laughs> Hopefully not in his window. Uh, so <clears throat> first thing we have to do, we have to get all this software we're gonna talk about to work together. And for Windows, ASCOM is the platform that is predominantly used. ASCOM stands for Astronomy Component Object Model, in case there's any software people out there. Uh, and what it does is it provides a very standardized interface to most of the devices. So device drivers that are written to work within the ASCOM system follow a standard, the standard is published, and because they follow that standard, any COM-enabled software, uh, COM, by the way, uh, used to be called OLE in Windows, so even Excel can drive your telescope if you uh, are using the ASCOM platform. There are a number of other platforms, such as Indy, uh, which is quite good in the Linux world and the Mac world, but if you're using Windows, ASCOM pretty much rules the day. Uh, so let's see what we've got here. <clears throat> a little bit of history. Uh, ASCOM was originally developed by Bob Denny uh, with a telescope control application called ACP. And uh, it was pretty basic, uh, but it did describe a standard for uh, telescope drivers. And Bob, managed to convince Doug George to sign on and add support to Maxim DL. And at that point, ASCOM as we know it today was born. Uh, you had uh, a, a nice generic way of accessing telescope mounts and of accessing your camera through Maxim DL. And the combination of those two gave us the ability to truly have an automated or remote observing system that an amateur could use. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, it uses the Windows COM interface. Um, I'm not going to get into the detail on that, but if anyone wants to ask questions later, I can answer some of them at any rate. And it provides a standardized interface to users. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit here. Uh, that standardized interface allows a common way that all other software in the system can access things. So it doesn't matter whose mount you use, whether it's Celestron, Mead, uh, Skywatcher, if they've got an ASCOM driver, you access them all the same way. What that means is once you have a program that works with one mount, it works with all the other mounts. Same for the cameras and any other device in the system. Really doesn't matter who supplies the hardware, as long as they are ASCOM compliant, you should be able to access them exactly the same way. Um, vendors for those devices create ASCOM drivers and they have drivers for almost everything, including things like dome controllers, focusers, cameras. The one thing they don't have a good driver for yet is DSLRs, which annoys me to no end because I can't use an ASCOM DSLR driver, at least not for my camera. So let's take a look at the ASCOM architecture here and how all of this stuff sort of uh, fits together. This is a very rough diagram, so please bear with me. Um, so the way this works, uh, I'm assuming everyone can see my mouse, if someone would answer there. Okay, I see Paul shaking his head. So the software on the left-hand side here is things like your camera control software, your mount control software, planetarium software. At the far right, we have the hardware. So this is the mount and camera and anything else you might have. Uh, I'm trying not to talk with my hands here, which I usually do because it doesn't come across well on the camera. Um, so if you see the occasional hand go by, I'm so used to doing it. We have here mount drivers and camera drivers, and these are written to be ASCOM compliant. So basically looking in this side of that driver, every mount looks the same. 
looking in this side of this camera driver, every camera looks the same. What goes on out here is totally hardware dependent. So if you've got a Celestron mount, the messages that go back and forth, the features available are different than if you've got a uh, Mead mount or uh, you know, a, a Skywatcher or even a Power mount. Uh, but on this side of the driver, they all look the same. The ASCOM platform in the middle here is really two things. It's a, a group of standardized interfaces um, that are implemented by the drivers out here. And it's also a collection of helper software, things like dialog boxes and that sort of thing, so that all ASCOM packages even look very, very similar. Um, I think we covered most of this. The drivers supply the interface, and uh, not all devices, though, have to go through ASCOM in your setup. There's also some communication that goes back and forth between software out here. You'll notice that PHD can talk to the camera software. PHD can also talk to the mount control software, but in this case, it can do it through ASCOM, or it can do it directly just because of the way the software is configured. So let's take a look at some of this software that can be integrated through ASCOM. So first thing we're gonna take a look at is PHD. Now PHD um, stands for push here dummy, in case anyone is curious. Uh, and that's actually a pretty good description of the software. It was originally written as PHD with no number next to it. Uh, this is PHD2, by the way, if anyone is interested. PHD was originally developed by Stark Labs. They're the people that write a software package called Nebulosity for uh, image processing. And uh, it's a really nice guiding package is the basic way to put it. Uh, it's a couple of buttons to click and then it will do almost everything automatically, including selecting the best guide start in the image. Uh, we're gonna take a look at that in a little bit. Obviously there are no stars up, so I'll use a simulator to give you an idea of uh, what that'll do. But the basic display is straightforward. This is an image taken from the guide camera. Here are some stars in that image. Um, over here uh, is uh, a, a zoomed in view of the star that uh, is in this area right here. This tells you how your guiding is going. The little vertical bars that you see there uh, are uh, the actual corrections that are made. And this is the trace of error over time. This is a bullseye view of the same thing. So basically what you want is you wanna have a very low guide error and you'd like to have all of the dots in this plot clumped near the center. Uh, <clears throat> assuming you have that, that means you're guiding well and uh, you should get reasonably round stars. Next on the list is some telescope control software. There's a whole variety of them out there. This happens to be one I wrote that I use fairly frequently for doing mosaics. Uh, there are others, uh, but uh, basically they connect through that ASCOM driver and you can have more than one of them connected at a time. So I typically have mosaic engine running when I'm doing a mosaic and I'll have ECU connected as well so I can see what's going on. Speaking of ECU, we also want some planetarium software. Um, it's not 100% necessary, but I'll tell you, it makes life a whole lot easier to be able to see where the telescope is pointed in the sky, assuming you're not out at the telescope. And that's where this comes in very handy. You can turn on the telescope interface with uh, this little button right here and get a view of where the telescope is in the sky. You'll get a set of crosshairs that moves around the sky with the telescope. And we also have, of course, camera control software. Now the camera control software that I use called Backyard EOS, uh, there's a whole variety of different uh, control software out there. Uh, each manufacturer of CCD cameras tends to make their own. And those pieces of software are usually ASCOM compliant. In the DSLR, DSLR world, unfortunately, there isn't a good ASCOM compliant driver, so you usually end up using a third party package. In this case, Backyard EOS, there's another package called Backyard Nikon, which covers EOS and Nikon, or it covers Canon and Nikon cameras, and it's a pretty good little package. There are lots of other packages out there, things like Sequence Generator Pro and a few others, that will work quite well. Um, so it's basically find the package that works the way you want to work and stick with it and uh, all will be well. So workflow for a typical evening under the stars. Um, this is a, a workflow. It's a combination of my workflow and Jerry's workflow. 
Uh, mine usually involves the four letter words, so you'll see that come up. You check the clear dark sky chart or astrophoric for suitable conditions. There aren't any, so you swear. Uh, assuming there are, you drive out somewhere and set up your equipment. You do an initial rough polar alignment, adjust focusing using a Batnov mask, align the mount using reference and calibration stars, accurately polar align, which takes a little bit of time. And then this was sort of Jerry's uh, workflow then was to accidentally kick the tripod, lose power, start all over again and swear. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, once you get all that done, you set up your guider and your guiding and slew to a target or plate solve the existing image for the target if you happen to be close by. Uh, configure your camera and image capture software and then watch the clouds roll in or swear. But assuming all that works properly, then you go look through Mark Scope for the rest of the evening. Uh, and because your system is running with ASCOM and a bunch of other software, you really, for the most part, don't have to do anything for the rest of the night. However, once you're all finished, assuming you're taking uh, dark frames, it's a good time to take them before the session ends. I rarely use them anymore. Um, I typically just take one each evening and use it as a hot pixel map. Uh, and then pack up and go home. And uh, as Jerry can tell you, you usually iterate back and forth a few times from getting accurate polar alignment to kicking the mount or losing power. And you go around that loop a few times while you're setting up. But that'll give you an idea sort of, of the, uh, the uh, night's activity for uh, taking photos. The nice part about it is because it's all software driven, once you get down to this part, and you've got everything running and you're snapping your first pictures, like I said, you go look through someone else's telescope. Uh, I recommend Mark's. It's very nice to look through his telescope. It looks like some of the pictures we take. So this will give you an idea then. Uh, we'll do a little demo here, but just in this particular view, I wanted to point a few things out with Backyard EOS. Uh, maybe I'll wait till I actually bring up the actual software. Uh, before I go on to the actual demo, um, is uh, Paul, if you're looking, have there been any questions come in? Not so far. Okay, good enough. I'll, I'll keep moving on then. So I'm gonna close down the presentation now and uh, hopefully pop over to the view of my telescope in the garage. Uh, I say hopefully because that Okay, now people should now be able to see my screen. Uh, I'm assuming you can see my screen there, uh, Judy. Okay, what I'm gonna do, we'll now log into the other two computers that are running here. One is uh, taking a picture of my garage at the moment with the telescope in it. The other one is taking a picture of, uh, a, well, it's not a picture, it's a, a remote desktop session running on my tablet. Now, if you take a look, Here's the telescope. I have to uh, just move my video images here so I can see things on my screen. Uh, maybe I'll just shrink it down for now. There we go. Uh, if you take a look, here's my scope on the mount. And right here, although it's a little hard to see, is the tablet that's controlling everything out of my garage. Uh, the whole system sits on a uh, scope buggy so I can just wheel it out fairly quickly. Uh, this is, if I close this down, this is Backyard EOS. The camera is connected and uh, assuming everything is behaving as it should be, if I tell it to select frame and focus, here are the trees behind my neighbor's house. Um, turn that off because it eats the battery here. And what we're gonna do here, when you start off your night imaging, and this is, first thing you have to do is get the telescope set up. So the telescope control package that I use is a package developed by Celestron. It's called CPWI. And what you end up doing here is very first thing you have to align the telescope to the sky. So we're gonna just lie to the telescope as it goes through here. But what we'll do, I'm going to, uh, let's see here, delete the alignment, and we're gonna perform an alignment. Um, and We'll do a manual alignment and tell it to begin. So the very first thing it wants to do is to go to the home position. Now, if I did this right, I should 
be able to shrink this screen down just a little bit. And you should be able to see over on this screen, the telescope actually do its thing. So first thing we do, we tell the telescope to move to its home position. Hey, it worked, look at that. The uh, telescope is now moving to the home position. My mount has sensors, so it uh, automatically finds the home position. And if I did this right, it won't hit the garage door. Yeah, it looks like I did it right, good. <clears throat> Hopefully, anyway. So now the telescope is moved to its home position and you can actually see that, if I move this out of the way here, you'll see this little green dot here, this little green cross actually shows where the telescope thinks it's pointed right now. Oops. So the next thing we would do from this point is select a few stars. So let's see, we'll select Alpha Rats as one of the stars. We tell the telescope to go there. And you can see if I move this out of the way again, the telescope is moving and it will move over toward Alpha Rats. I move this down a bit. There we go. Now, once it gets there, what you have to do at that point is you have to use these controls to center the star in the oops right now in the image that you would get from the camera now as you can see right now the camera is just looking at my garage door there are no stars but you get the idea once that's all centered up you could then click the next star after you go through about four stars the telescope control package usually has things pretty well in hand <clears throat> and it will tell you that you have aligned oops it will tell you that you finished the alignment. So I'm just going to uh, lie to it and tell it that we have finished the alignment. Uh, it'll probably complain at me here. No, nope, there we go. Let's me say the alignment is complete. The next thing you'd want to do is to polar align. And in this case, that's actually fairly straightforward because Celestron has a really, really nice algorithm for doing polar alignment. And it works this way. We're going to go to a star. Oops, let me blow that up full screen again. We're gonna to go to a star in the south. And so if we come down here, so here's the sun as an example, right? But we'll pick a star. You usually wanna pick a fairly bright star uh, and you want it down somewhere near the celestial equator. You don't have to use the southern stars, although they work the best. So if we, for instance, were to pick, um, I'm just gonna arbitrarily pick a star, it really doesn't matter which one, we'll try Aldebaran here uh, and tell it to go there. And if I did that right, hopefully the telescope will whack off anything. Blair? Yes, ma'am. A question is asked, what software do you use on your tablet for imaging? Uh, I mentioned that earlier, the actual uh, software to collect the image data is Backyard EOS. I use, uh, you can see the DSLR camera at the back there, and uh, Backyard EOS is a pretty good package for doing that sort of stuff with a Canon camera. Thank you. Yep. So now the telescope is moving to the southern sky. Uh, in actual fact, in this case, it's just moving to the back of my garage. Uh, we could probably go a little further south, but for now, we'll use that. South would be back here in this case. And now what we would do at that point, the telescope knows its way around the sky, but if you select all star polar alignment, once it comes up, uh, oh, it wants more stars for my model. So I'm gonna just explain what would happen here. It will do a go-to to the selected star, but it won't go right to the star. It'll go to where the star would be if you were properly polar aligned. Then what you do is you simply adjust the mount in elevation and azimuth until that star is in the center of the crosshairs on your camera and you're done and you are polar aligned very accurately, usually within about an arc minute or so. And uh, it takes about five minutes, if that. Um, 
usually takes me more time to walk out to the telescope than it does to actually get it polar aligned. Uh, so uh, I, I heartily recommend some of these software solutions for polar alignment. By the way, anyone that has a Celestron computer controlled mount, you do not need this software package to access this. All-Star Polar Alignment is actually built into the mount software. Now, let's see here. If this works properly, I should be able to zoom back in. There we go. So that gives you an idea of how you can control the telescope and move it around the sky through ASCOM. We can also, at that point, control the guider. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run through a connection to the guider. So basically, all I've done, I've told this to connect up to the equipment. As you can see, I'm not connected right now, and I'm not actually going to connect to my camera. I'm going to connect to a simulator, just so you can see how this all works. So what we're going to do, we're going to connect to all the devices. And uh, once it has done so, now it's connected, camera's connected. There we go. So you would then tell the camera to start taking exposures. So I'm going to select, once it shows up here, about a one-second exposure. And if I simply tell it to start looping, as it's called, which is just taking a bunch of exposures, you will see from that that uh, here's the image with a few stars in it. All you have to do to get things up and running is select the star. Once I select a star, it shows up over here in this display. And from there on, if I click Guide, which is this, right, that star uh, will once it finishes, there we go, it's actually now calibrating. And if you were to look, and you, uh, we might be able to here, let's see, probably won't see any of the motion because it will be very tiny, but it's actually moving the telescope in small increments, and it's measuring which way everything moves. Uh, it's doing that so it knows which correction moves in which direction. Now, since I'm using the simulator, this calibration will fail, uh, most likely here, because of course the, the uh, the simulator doesn't actually move, uh, at least not in the mode I have it. You can actually set it up in a mode where the simulator will move and let you test everything. I don't have it in that mode. So what PhD is going to do once it has finished calibrating is it's going to attempt to keep this star on those crosshairs. As I said, this calibration will fail, so I might as well just stop it because it'll go forever. Um, and it will keep that star centered nicely in the crosshairs the whole time you're taking an image. The next piece of software we're going to want to look at is the actual image control software, <clears throat> or the camera control software, I should say. And the software that I use, as I said, is called Backyard EOS. Most of these pieces of software work in a very similar way. So I can connect and disconnect from the camera. Because I'm using a DSLR, it has a video mode or a live view mode, and I can use frame and focus for that, and it's great for trying to get things in focus originally. <clears throat> um, you can also move around targets like the moon and see it in real time, which is what we'll do on the uh, lunar observing evening, hopefully tomorrow night, but we'll have to see how the weather is. Um, on the imaging tab, however, what you have here is the ability to set a whole variety of image plans. So for instance, I can take, in this case, seven exposures with bulb setting on my camera. I don't happen to have bulb turned on at the moment. So we'll take uh, a bunch of settings with, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say a uh, hundredth of a second exposure. You can, if you are in bulb mode, uh, my camera's not set to bulb mode at the moment, but if you're in bulb mode, you can set the duration of each exposure. So I could set this to five minutes. Uh, this is in seconds, so five minutes would be 300 seconds. I can set the ISO I want to use. So for instance, I can use ISO 800. And this pause here is the delay time between, uh, let me just turn on one more here, a sec. Okay, so this pause that you see here is the delay time between this step in the imaging and this step. So if you were using multiple filters, or in my case, since I'm doing a mosaic, I would want to make sure that my mount has time to move to the new target and stabilize, you set the delay parameter in here. So you might set 60 seconds here for the mount to actually move and acquire the next target. 
So you could actually set up an imaging run of multiple targets in one night. Um, <clears throat> one thing they did not do well with this software, and I've asked for uh, changes to it, we'll see what happens, is this target name is fixed for all of these imaging sessions. So if you select uh, M42 for your first target right here, and for your next target, you were to try and do M1, the target name will not change, unfortunately. So I usually leave it blank and I just separate them by time. Um, in this case, I'm connected to my camera via USB and I'm saving images both on my PC, the tablet out of the computer, and my actual camera card. I almost always do that. And the reason being that uh, sometimes the connection to the computer will fail or the computer will crash and do something funny. And if it happens to corrupt the hard drive or the SD card in the uh, computer that I'm saving things to, my night's data is not lost because it's also on the camera. Always a good uh, thing to watch out for when you're uh, doing some of this stuff. And I think that is pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, let me see here, so you can see where the telescope is at the moment, still pointed at the ceiling. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, if not, we'll move on to whatever the next talk is there. I have to stop sharing my screen first. There we go. Okay, uh, any questions? That looked pretty good, Blair. Thank you. You're more than welcome. You get to do it next time. I know. For Mac, for Mac users. <laughs> I do have one question for you, Blair. Um, where is it that you, if you wanted to, to view, say, M42 and then M1, where do you set up that list of things you want to actually look at? Which software does that? Um, as when you say to look at, do you mean which software moves the telescope to those targets? Yes, if you want to take a bunch of exposures of M42, then move the telescope to M1, then move it to M35. If, if I want to do all that automatically, my own software that I wrote, which if I can get it to show up here, um, hopefully you can see this, uh, this particular piece of software, Mosaic Engine, uh, lets me do that. I can actually make, uh, oops, where is it? A multi-target list where I simply haul objects into a list and I can bring them from uh, any of the lists that uh, I supply with the software or I can key them in manually. So I can get them from the IC list, I can get them from the Messier list, uh, name stars list, NGC list, whatever else I want to put in there. Uh, so I, I tend to use my own software for that. There are lots of automated tools for doing that sort of stuff. Uh, Sequence Generator Pro works quite well. I know Dave Lane has his own package that he uses in his observatory. Um, so it's basically whatever software you want to use to automate the whole thing. Um, the Next. software that, sorry, the software that I've shown you other than Mosaic Engine uh, is all designed for you to sit there and manually tell it to move from one target to another. Uh, I use Mosaic Engine to automate that whole process. Next month uh, in K-Stars, I'll show you a scheduler that's built in that lets you uh, choose and uh, rationalize targets. Any other questions? There's a question from the audience, uh, from Brad. Uh, going back to when you had the telescope move to Alpharats, is there a yeah. set menu of stars to go to, or could you type in, say, an obscure fifth or sixth magnitude star? Uh, the answer to both of those questions is yes. Uh, if you go to the telescope control software here, uh, you can click on any star in the window and have it move there. Uh, while you are doing an alignment, it will also make suggestions. So for instance, if we, um, if we lie to this thing and, uh, one second here, tell it to begin. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna tell it to begin the alignment again. And I just wanna make sure that it's moving properly here and not about to uh, bang on anything. Um, find home, there we go. So you can see the telescope is now moving back to the home position. Um, you have to reshare your screen, Blair. Oh, sorry. You have to reshare uh, your screen. Yeah, one sec. There we go, you see it now? Okay, so the telescope is moving back to the home position. 
once it finds that home position, um, and uh, it'll have finished it here in just a moment. Okay, now at this point, you could click on any star in the sky to begin the alignment process, but you can also select from this drop down. So it'll give you a couple of stars in the southwestern sky, a couple of stars in the northwestern. Uh, you get the idea. Um, oops. It will allow you to basically move in four quadrants in the sky southeastern, southwestern, northeastern, and northwestern. And you can select from those stars as well. It's usually a good way to go because it selects fairly bright stars. Uh, the problem with that is the star may be in a tree, uh, at least from my driveway. So typically what I will do is I will usually use the suggested stars and then see if I can see it in the camera. If I cannot, then I'll usually just click on a star nearby in the graphical interface. Um, so, you know, it'll say I'm right here right now. And if I don't want that star, I could easily click here and tell it to go to that star. Uh, when it comes to polar alignment, the software is a little less forgiving. Um, what I mean by that is while you're aligning the telescope to the sky, I could tell it to go to this star and find it still in a tree. Then I could tell it to go to this star. When you're doing polar alignment, you only get one chance. So you can click all star polar alignment and you can tell it to go to a star from the drop down list or you can click on a star. After that, if that star is in a tree, you are, uh, to put it quite bluntly, screwed. You have to go all the way back, turn off the telescope, redo everything. It's a bit of a flaw in this software. Um, it's uh, a flaw that they are correcting in the next iteration. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. And another question from uh, Terry uh, DeVoe. Oh, whoops, lost it. Second, <clears throat> let me get to the uh, chat. Um, I lost my chat. What happened? <coughs> I think I see it here. Um, He's asked why software yeah. not automatically turn the camera to bold mode. Y yes. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is no. And it's not a fault with the software. It's a fault with several versions of Canon cameras. Um, some of the newer cameras, you can select bulb uh, programmatically, but in the 60DA that I use, you have to go out and rotate the little wheel on the camera. You can select manual, which will let you go from the minimum exposure the camera will do all the way up to 30 seconds. And then if you want longer than that, you must go turn the wheel on the camera to bulb mode. It's a manual selection. Uh, that's not the same for all cameras, just for some Canons. And another question is, are there any special tricks needed for photographing comets? Um, a bright yes comet. and no. Um, the, the short answer is yes and no. Uh, you can take multiple shorter exposures and get a comet. The trick is usually in processing them. You can also change on some telescopes, you can change guide rates to actually track the comet. Uh, comets don't move at the sidereal rate for the most part. Uh, so telescope tracking, you could track, for instance, using PhD and have it follow it, which would leave slightly trailed stars. So what I usually do is I take shorter exposures so I get tight stars, but then I can combine all those exposures and get effectively a long exposure on the comet. Uh, and if you do that with a median combine, all the stars disappear. Then you can do another combination to get good stars and put the two together and get a nice image. It's a little bit of work, but it works out pretty well. Any other questions? Aside from Dave Lane yelling at me to share my screen. <laughs> Thank you. She's on the computer right now talking to somebody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I have a feeling that we have a grandchild down at the bottom of our stairs. <laughs> but in any case, thanks, Blair. I don't see any other questions under Q and A or chat. So thank you so much for your presentation. No problem. I'm impressed. All three computers kept working the whole time. Oh, hey, the stars are aligned, so to speak. <coughs> um, Paul Heath. You're up next with a youth activity and a really cool one too on how to make stars. 
Well, it's actually hot because it's stars. <laughs> okay, now you have to share your, your screen. Oh. Uh, Down at the bottom. Share screen. Actually, you don't have anything to share, do you? I forgot how we got him to get full screen, but I think it's... No, I don't have anything here I can share other than the screen you're on. I got my vid... Should my video come through? I think the full screen is set by the individual people walking, whether they set it for full screen or want it in, in a window, but... I have Paul full screen. I haven't done anything that he's been full screen and everybody has been right since I started because I set my zoom on my side just to view full screen mode. Okay, so everyone can see him full screen now then. If, yeah. if they so turn that turn it on, otherwise they should see him in a smaller window, but they should still see him while he's presenting. Okay, okay so very I good. Can, I can just go ahead then? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, basically we have a couple things we need to have to start this. We need glue, white glue, uh, a round balloon, <coughs> that we can blow up to, uh, okay, it just disappeared. Uh, can everybody see that on the camera? Because it just disappeared in mine. But uh, we set our balloon, get our balloon up. Try to get it so it doesn't lock on your fingers. This is the hard part. Okay, once, we, well, once we've got our balloon, we can make it to any size. So if you want to do uh, a red dwarf star, we have a small balloon, our regular star, sun, or we can go to a, our larger star. And uh, are they showing up clear for you guys? Because I'm not seeing it very clear on my my screen. Is that I showing think, clear for everyone? I think they're close enough in color to whatever your background green screen is. That you're just looking straight through them to the background. Oh, okay. So that's just my end. Yeah. Well, no, we, we're seeing it too, but... Just don't hold them as close, Paul. There you go. Okay, there. Okay. So basically, what you want to do is... All right, I'm going to go with the the red star. And you need crepe paper as well. Take strips of a single layer of crepe paper and your balloon. It doesn't really matter what color the balloon is, but you start with your glue and you dab the glue onto the balloon. So you can see, can everybody see that the balloon has uh, got the glue on it? And you just layer your, start your, your crepe paper on and you just keep dabbing it just keep dabbing it on and pulling the crepe paper over now you'll wrap the balloon with the glue a little bit at a time till it's all the way around and what you will do is you'll keep wrapping your balloon until you can't see the color of the balloon if you can still see the color of blue and you have to make more layers on. With the red, it's not too bad. Or if you even start with a red balloon, it's a little faster or what color balloon. But you wrap the crepe paper around till it's, it's all, so you can't see the color of the balloon. Now, what that'll do once it dries is that if you look close here, I should be able to go, you can see the modeled effect on the balloon. That will, appear to be like the flocula, the big uh, convection cells that are on the sun. So once it's all glued, you pat it together and let it dry, hang it up. I usually put a, a felt pole on it to hold it or a string to hold it up while it dries. And once the balloon is dried, you have your star. Now you can use a magic marker. Can everybody see the, the sunspot? You can mark your sunspots on it. Or you can add little pieces of uh, tissue paper to make uh, prominences or flares on your star. Now, once you have this, I mean, this is the start of your solar system. So next time we'll look at adding the planets to the solar system. But the, the trick is 
to glue your, your paper a little bit at a time, dab your glue onto your, onto your balloon, and uh, not a lot of glue, just little dabs, and then let it stick to the balloon. And as it's wrapped completely around and the color of the balloon disappears, you'll have your star. Pat it all down flat and then let it dry. And once you've got the appearance of your star, then you can add sunspots and prominences, whichever the case you want to do, depending on the size of stars. And you can use that. You've got your a sun type or a red dwarf, or you can get a large, uh, the best I've been able to do with round balloons is uh, a no tight star, which is about, you can blow up your balloon about twice as big before it explodes. And uh, once it explodes, you have your supernova already made. So you can go that way. But it's a fairly straightforward, simple way to do it. And uh, you can make different uh, stars. And the what I like with this and why I use tissue paper, is that once the glue dries and the, and the tissue paper is on the balloon, you can, you can get the, the, the appearance of a real star. The flocula, the, the, the convection cells appear as the little, little clear and dark patches on your balloon, and then you can put your sunspots in, and you can make it as realistic as, as uh, fairly realistic as your model. And that'll give you a good idea of, of uh, you can talk about, uh, how the sunspots will progress across the sun and uh, you can go into a detail with a model that looks like a star. So it's a fun little activity. Uh, kids can do it, adults can do it, and it's great for the classrooms as well. Um, I've gone into classrooms over a couple day period and have them build the stars the next day and then we'll work on our on our planets the next day. So it, uh, it's a great way to start. It's a great activity if you're cooped up in your house, you can make a whole bunch of stars to brighten up your day. Okay, that's pretty well it for me. That's great, Paul, thanks. Any questions for Paul? Remember, you use white glue, that's the best. Uh, I've, tried, I've tried heavier glues, and when they dry, they tend to pop the balloon, so you wanna, wanna stick with the white glue for this. Okay. I have a question for Paul. Yes. Dave here. So I used to use uh, balloons in classroom presentations. I, I used to do this thing, the colors of the stars, and I would take different balloons in with different colors and blow them up. And I got shut down one time because there was a kid in the school with a latex allergy, and they said I couldn't use balloons. Have you ever come across that? Uh, no, I no, I haven't. But uh, I know what you're saying. Uh, I've had. Uh, other ones that are uh, allergic to other objects I've used for demonstrations. So, so if you have the opportunity to contact the teacher in advance, I've done that a few times, but uh, yeah. I haven't run into the latex one, but I, I am aware of it because I work with people with, with that problem. But are there, are there latex? Some, I, I think you can get balloons that aren't, aren't latex, yeah. but you, you'd have to be searching through the specialty stores for that. Yeah. But the, the idea is to get around the, the round balloons, because the long balloons just doesn't have the same effect. No. But, um, I know you can get non-latex because we use them at the Discovery Center once. I, I used to, I can do the activity with uh, like cutting out paper circles, but it's not as much fun as blowing up balloons. Yeah, and I find with the tissue paper, they can actually make a star that looks like a star. Yeah. So it's a okay, fun, fun way to do it. Hey. Thanks, Paul. Um, last but not least for presentations is Paul Gray, and he's our, our special presentation this afternoon. Uh, his special. topic is, oh, you're special, <laughs> uh, on variable stars, observing them and recording them. Well, hello. Uh, this is not meant to be a long presentation. I really just wanted to follow up on all the excitement around Betelgeuse for the last four months and uh, try to get people actually thinking about observing variable stars. Quite often the question is, is how do we do it? And uh, that's kind of what I want to do today is show you how to do it. So I'm going to share my screen here. I'll actually share my desktop. Share. And we will go right into... Oh boy. 
All right, so am I visible to everybody as far as a slide presentation? You're good. Good, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I'm no expert on variable stars. I have maybe made 50 to 100 observations in my 20 something years of observing uh, when it comes to variables. I've never really gotten heavy into it, but at times it's be, become a bit of an interest because there, there are some interesting variables out there, especially this past winter, we've, we've all learned Betelgeuse can do some odd things. Um, for the most part, it's a fairly regular variable that is every you know 400 or so days, it goes through a minima where it drips, drops from brightness of about 0.9 magnitude down to about one and a half magnitude or, or, or something like that. And um, this year it's dropped by almost twice that and it, people are kind of wondering if there's something different going on. But if you look back in history, you know, 40, 50 years ago, did the same kind of thing. So you, you never know, but that's the beauty of variable stars. You never know what they're gonna do. But since I'm no expert, I can't teach you everything. Uh, what I recommend is get a good book. And this is the book I recommend. It's a little dated now, it was written back in the 90s, but the basis of how to make variable star observations and the basis of stars in it to, to begin with and to learn all the different types of variables, it's very, um, it's an extensive book that covers all the basics as well as gives you a good background on, on the different types of variables that are out there to look with. And for the most part, this book is purely for the visual observers. It's almost entirely about visual observations. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about today too, is about making visual observations. So I'm going to jump right into it and go right into uh, what a variable star chart looks like. I'm not going to get into uh, showing you around the night sky to where to find variables. I'm going to assume most of us uh, who are here have had the opportunity to be under the stars and learn the constellations. And those who are newer and are interested in doing this, um, this is a good reason to learn the constellations is because because quite often variable stars, the brighter ones that are ones that you can see with just your eyes or with just binoculars, are easily found on maps provided by the American Association of Variable Star Observers, which I'm going to show you some of their information as well here in a bit in the website. Um, they have great maps that uh, for the naked eye stars are visible at, within constellations. Much like this example one, this is actually out of their tutorial, and I'm gonna mention this a few times, but um, the tutorial uh, has, has a great set of maps and a good basis of, of uh, how, to, how to do things as well. So start, starting with a basic map, this is the constellation of Auriga. Uh, you can see the just above right of center, there's only one star with a name on it. It's uh, Capella. I'm hoping it's legible to everybody. I'm not sure how well the digitally things go through here, but um, Capella is the brightest star on the map. It does not have a number by it. You notice there are four, five other stars that have numbers beside them. And then there are a number of other dots on the, on the map as well. They're all stars. And there's one uh, star at the lower right end of Auriga there has the Greek symbol by it. And I can't quite make out what it is, to, uh, even on my screen, so just a little too fuzzy. But uh, what you're looking at is the constellation of Riga. You've got the one bright star named Capella. Those other stars that have numbers, they're, they're not names or designations. Those are actually the magnitudes of those stars. So those are your comparison stars. They will not put dots in on a chart uh, for magnitude. So uh, one, one nine there for the brightest star to the left of Capella is actually 1.9 magnitude. Um, and then below that is a, the two six is actually for representing a 2.6 magnitude star and so on until you get down to the far right where it's a 4.3 magnitude star. The target star or the variable star for a chart that you're looking at or that you're looking to locate is always highlighted by the, the cross, the crisscross hairs there, which is just to the lower right of Capella, and that's labeled as the variable star. So that would be the star you're going out to find. Uh, other stars I mentioned down in the bottom of the chart, there are other stars that are either smaller or bigger. They're not labeled. Sometimes they will have Greek symbols on them, but that would be it. They will not have the uh, numbered system in on these star charts. And just like in the sky, um, in general, the brighter stars on, stars on the map will be bigger dots. So the bigger the dot, the brighter the star, the smaller the dot, the fainter the star. Pretty intuitive. It's, um, it's not rocket science, but uh, it does take some uh, learning to get used to. You notice the directions on the map, north is top, south is at the bottom, west is to your right, and east is to your left. 
again, when you're looking up the sky, if you're standing facing south and you look up at the sky, west is to your right, east is to your left. Um, so depending on which way you're looking at a map, if you're looking at, at it as we traditionally do, what north is up. Because you're using your own eyes, you're not using any reflections in a telescope or refractions, then east is going to be to your left uh, towards the eastern horizon. All right, no questions? So I don't see the question and answer thing, so I'm assuming there's no questions now, Judy. I'll move on. That is correct. So getting into the, the whole meat of things, how do you make a, an observation? Now I'm going to use Orion and Betelgeuse here as an example. Uh, this is one of the examples they, they use from the, uh, the AAVSO, and by no means are these charts meant to be used for actually doing estimates. Um, you'll learn if you do any reading about uh, estimating Betelgeuse that Rigel, the bottom right of Orion, is actually not one of the good stars to do because they're quite different in color um, as well. So, But for the purpose of showing how to make an estimate, uh, this works. So we'll start with the, the diagram on the left. Uh, Betelgeuse obviously is quite bright. It's shown as a big dot there. That's the star we want to locate. And the two stars they're giving us to compare it to is Rigel down in the lower right, it's, uh, which is a 0 0.1 magnitude. And then um, the lower left star in Orion's uh, shape there, the, the lower left foot is listed as a 2.1 magnitude. So in this case, it's quite simple. You're basically, you're comparing Betelgeuse in the night sky to those two stars, and you're trying to figure out which one is the closest to, is it the same as either one of those, or is it halfway between them? And in this case, Betelgeuse, the dot, and Rigel are the same size. So in effect, what they're saying is if you're looking at them in the sky, Betelgeuse and Rigel, if they're the same brightness to your eyes, then obviously, Betelgeuse is the same brightness as Rigel. So if Rigel is 0.1 magnitude, which is a known steady magnitude, then you know Betelgeuse is 0.1. It's not the 2.1. It's not even halfway there. It's, 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 it's as bright as Rigel is. Make sense, everyone? See, Judy said nodding. So let's move to the chart on the right. Now you see the dot for Betelgeuse is shown as much smaller. So if you're looking at the sky, assume that Betelgeuse is fainter. It's not as bright as it was uh, say a month ago when you looked at it on the left picture. So it's, it's, it's a painter star. Again, you're comparing it to the two known stars of magnitudes that you have on the chart. Rigel is 0 0.1 and the other star 2.1. So again, by looking at it, is Betelgeuse as big and bright as Rigel or is it smaller and as bright as the 2.1 star? In this case, it's the same as the 2.1 star. So Betelgeuse would be an estimate of 2.1 magnitude at that time of your observation. So that's great if the star is the same brightness as your comparison star, right? Because it's pretty easy. You know, well, it's the same brightness as that, then it's that magnitude. Let's go to the next example. What if your star is not the same brightness of one of your comparison stars? What if it's in between? How do you do that? So in this case, we're going to say Betelgeuse is about halfway in brightness between the big star of Rigel and the little star 2.1. So what you can do is you can kind of assume you're, you're making the assumption that if the star is half as bright as Rigel, between that 0 0.1 and 2.1. You can picture that as a step. Uh, 0.1 to 1.1 would be one step, 1.1 to 2.1 would be the second step. If Betelgeuse is one step or halfway between the two, then you can assume it's or give it a magnitude of 1.1. So you just estimated it to be half the bright as Rigel or 1.1 magnitude. So depending on the variable star you're looking at, Betelgeuse, for example, when it's going through a, a phase like it did this winter where it drops in brightness, it's worth going out and estimating it once a night. And if not night by night, then probably every three, four, five nights, you will probably notice a change. You will notice a step. Most beginning observers of variable stars, not just beginning observers of stars or observers period, but most variable star beginners uh, when you start estimating magnitudes, when, when you're really getting critical and looking at two stars and trying to estimate magnitudes, at best you'll be doing a 0.1 or a one-tenth of an estimate between brightness of stars. You, can, you just It takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice um, to say something would be less than 0.1 of a magnitude difference from another. Um, for example, in this case, you could break the steps into the two steps, one or 0 0.1, 1.1, 1 .1, and 2.1, and you could go with that. You could break it even further, depending on how good your, your estimating skills are, your observing skills are. 
by saying, well, it's not halfway between the two. It's more about a quarter way between between halfway and, and Rigel. And if it's a quarter way, then it's half of a magnitude between that in that first step. So instead of 0.1 going to 1.1, you're only going half a step, so you'd be going to 0.6. Um, to try and break that distance into 10 steps, or to break this 0.1 to 2.1 into 20 steps, it gets much more difficult. So a better chart with more stars, um, and more comparison stars makes that easier. We will get into that in a minute. Actually, I'm going to back up for a second. Uh, just go back to that first chart I showed you. For example, here, if you're estimating that variable star, you have one, two, three, four, five stars with about a 2.3, 2.4 magnitude spread. So you have five stars, 2.4 magnitudes to, to, to uh, estimate in between to kind of compare that to. You can say, well, it's not as bright as a 1.9, obviously. It's, so it looks like it's somewhere around the 2.6. When you compare it to the 3.2, well, it's bigger than the 3.2. So you know it's not going to be 3.8 or 4.3. You can then compare, is it closer to the 2.6 or closer to the 3.2? It looks closer to the 2.6. It actually might be a little bit bigger than 2.6 uh, on my screen. So I would say it's a little more than 2.6, but it's definitely not 1.9. So now you have 0 0.6 plus the 0.1 to 9, so you have 0.7 magnitude difference between 2.6 and 1.9. How much brighter is that star than 2.6? I would say 2.7, maybe 2.8. It's hard to say from these graphics. It's different when you're doing it from the stars, because the stars, of course, twinkle, they have color. Color can play a big role into it. Red stars are hard to... Uh, they're very hard to uh, estimate because the longer you look at a red star, your eye will actually do funky things and make it appear brighter. So uh, that's a whole, the Pridjenko effect is a whole other uh, lecture, I think, for somebody who's an optometrist. Uh, but that gives you the gist of how to make an estimate. So I'm just going to move forward here a bit now. Um, and we'll get into looking at some actual stars and uh, charts that, that you can estimate from. Now I want to get you as excited about some stars that are out there to look at. And these are all charts from the AVSO's 10 star tutorial program. So they're, they're easy to get and I'll show you where to find that shortly. Um, the first chart, and I want to show you this one because it is Betelgeuse. We are losing Betelgeuse, but it's still up in twilight. Uh, you can still get it after twilight for about an hour if you've got a western horizon. Um, and you can see what it's doing and it is still brightening. It's, it's uh, been coming back from its paint. But this is the chart that a lot of us were using for estimating, estimating Betelgeuse over the winter. So Betelgeuse is the top left star in Orion, uh, Alpha Orion there. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, uh, right here. So this is Betelgeuse. And, um, you know, as we just noted, uh, Rigel at 0 0.1 can be used. The 2.1 star in the lower left of the foot can be used. But uh, there's a number of other stars on this, this chart that are very easy to use. And the beauty of this is they're all naked eye stars. They're all bright winter stars. Um, Aldebaran up here, uh, 0 0.9 magnitude is often used, and uh, Castor and Pollux are as well, 1.1 1 .1 and 1.6 can be used. And uh, I don't see it on this chart, but there actually was a magnitude on, on this one on another chart that I was using, but it's not on this chart, uh, which was 1.7, I believe. That was a different chart. But uh, there, there's the 1.9 in, in, um, in Gemini as well uh, that can be used. So you can easily compare Orion just with your eyes and not having binoculars or anything. And knowing these three or four constellations, you can compare it to Procyon at 0 0.4, Darberon at 0.9, Pollux at 1.1, Castor at 1.6, and uh, you can go down to the 2.1 here uh, as well, or the 1.9 at the bottom of the Gemini. And that gives you an idea of quickly how quick you can just glance back and forth at these stars to kind of get an idea of how bright Betelgeuse is. And uh, like I said, Betelgeuse between a half a magnitude and, uh, and second magnitude is what it's bounced around with uh, this, this winter. There is another star on here, this chart. Uh, it's Eta Geminorium, which is actually located right here off of Gemini. And Eta Geminorium is... Um, well, I had the information on it here. It's actually an interesting star as well, but I don't have the information in front of me now for for how long its uh, variable rate is. I'm sorry. I thought I had my notes, but I don't have that one. 
So that, as, as I mentioned, we're losing this one. Winter is almost over. We are in that spring season where all the galaxies are coming up uh, for this, the deep sky observers and the imagers. But uh, there are variable stars at other times of the year as well. Uh, the next chart I'm going to show you, this one's actually quite nice because uh, Cassiopeia is circumpolar. So you can see it year round. And uh, Beta Percy is on here as well. Algo, which is a very famous star as well. And both of these are great stars. Um, We'll start with Beta Percy down in Perseus. Um, it's an eclipse and type variable, so it goes through eclipses every roughly three days. So I'm not going to give the exact number because I don't have it in front of me, but roughly every three days it'll drop in magnitude um, and over about three and a half, four hours, and then over three and a half, four hours it'll climb back up to its previous magnitude. And, and it's a couple magnitudes a drop. It's pretty significant. It's, um, it goes from one of the brightest stars in the constellation to just another one of the stars within the constellation in that part of the Milky Way. And then over three or four hours, you can easily see it climb back. And during the right time of year, um, either fall and winter especially, uh, when we get the longer nights, if you, if you get it timed perfectly and get a clear sky, you can catch the start of a, of a drop into eclipse early in the evening. And if you're a diehard and you go till two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, you can watch the entire thing. Go out every 15 minutes or half hour and you can watch the, uh, the star fade in brightness over three hours and then climb back up. So uh, Beta Percy is one of, one of the best ones. Uh, it's also nicknamed the Demon Star. And uh, it's an interesting one that's, um, I, I like to think of it as one that's great for a group project because it can be done in one night. We, we, you can do it as a group of people. You don't have to be together. And I'm thinking maybe this fall, this is something I'd like to try and organize. I did that when uh, when I was with the New Brunswick Center. We, we timed it so that we had a night that we, we knew all the nights in a month that it was going to be an eclipse. We knew the, the nights that it was timed perfectly, and there were like three of them. And if we said, you know, the first one of those nights that's clear, we're all going to observe Beta Perseus. And we, we did that, and we had about 12, 13 observers all made eight or 10 observations over five or six hours. Uh, we put all our information together and plotted it on a chart and uh, saw that we saw this drop in magnitude and got a light curve. It was kind of a neat little project. So uh, maybe come September, we'll visit this again, Judy, and do it as a pet project as a group, uh, especially if we're all still working from home. <laughs> we'll see how things go. <laughs> so that's Beta Percy. Uh, Gamma Cass is another one. It's also a naked eye variable and it's on this chart as well and uh, well worth taking some time to, uh, to look into if you're curious about doing these. Uh, CAS will be coming around soon. It's down under the pole star now in the evening, but it'll, it'll start climbing in the summertime uh, later in the evening. Uh, coming in the summer, it's not quite there yet. We're still just starting the spring, but uh, coming the summertime, uh, Lyra will be getting up there, Constellation Lyra, and it has a couple nice stars in it. The R Lyra and Beta Lyra are both variables. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to find. Vega is the, the brightest star in the constellation. It's part of the uh, summer triangle of the constellation Dave, uh, Deneb, Alter, Vega, as, as known by Dave Chapman. But uh, it's part of the summer triangle, so it's easy to find, and, and the constellation is quite distinct as well up here. With, even if you're just in the suburbs, the, the main constellation stars are decently visible. So Beta Lyra is. Um, is a, is a neat star and you can do it easily in the summertime. We get lots of beautiful nights in the summertime. You don't need to observe it many times a night. You can actually go out and observe this once a night. But the beauty of it is, it, excuse me, the beauty of it is it's, um, it varies between 3.4 and 4.4 magnitude. So if you're in the city, you might need binoculars to do it. Uh, it might be right at the edge of your, your sky brightness there in the city. But if you're out in the suburbs, if you're out um, camping or out at the cottage, uh, it's perfect because it's always placed high overhead. And it's a fairly easy naked eye, 3.4 to 4.4. And it goes through a complete cycle in about 13 days. So if you get a string of nice weather in the summertime of six, seven, eight days over, over a week, week and a half, two weeks, you can see the entire cycle in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and again, it's easy to locate. It's one of those main stars in the constellation of Lyra. The last one I'm going to talk about actually is uh, another constellation out of the Summer Triangle, um, well, Aquilia. The Altair is the A star in constellation Dave or the Summer Triangle. Uh, it's the bottom of the triangle, you know, so it's fairly easy to find. Um, I actually skipped a chart somewhere. 
but uh, we'll go on with this one. So in, in Aquaria, there is a, um, a deep star just below Altair called Eta Aquaria, and it's actually a delta C feed variable. Um, I don't think Dave Turner's tuned in. He'd be probably upset that I haven't mentioned, mentioned Delta CFI itself because that's his, one of his favorites. But uh, uh, Inequality is a Delta CFI variable as well. It again varies about uh, 3.5 to 4.4 magnitude. So it's easy to, to see. And you got two, three great stars all close together there on the chart. This is a fairly small patch of sky for the constellation of Quilia. Um, if you're in the city again, you might want might want to use binoculars just to, to help out. But uh, the 3.2, the 3.4, and the 3.7 stars are all right around it, and then the 4.4 stars just to the lower right. The all the stars make nice triangles that it makes it easy to, to locate those brighter stars and do your estimating from. And again, with 3.5 to 4.4, it's an easy uh, star to estimate, and you have some great uh, comparison stars there. And uh, it varies actually, it's got a little bit of a quicker cycle. It takes about seven days, seven to eight days to go through an entire cycle. So you could go out if you're, again, if you're camping at the cottage and you do an observation early in the evening and another one at bedtime, or if you gotta get up at, uh, you know, 5 a.m. to go to, the, go to the potty there for a break and it's still up, you can make a second estimate. Yeah, if you can get two estimates a night and do that over three or four nights over a week, you can probably get a decent little uh, light curve for this one as well. Um, and the idea of getting a light curve for yourself is kind of neat to plot it just to see that change in brightness. But uh, in the end, the, the beauty of doing all this is variable star observing, whether it's visual or photometry, uh, like Dave Lane does a lot with the, with the uh, Abbey Ridge Observatory, it's all important. A lot of the data that uh, the AADSL is gathering and scientists are still using, astronomers still use for, for studying light curves is visual data. It's one of the areas in astronomy where visual observations are still badly needed and badly wanted. Um, it's, it's Professionals don't have time to track all of the variables that are in the sky and they rely on amateurs for doing that. So having said that, I'm gonna flip over here and um, show you some stuff about the ABSO and what you can do once you make some observations. Uh, get to the APSO page. You should all be seeing my desktop there, the, the main page for the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Is that up, Judy? Yeah, okay. So if you go to the ABSO, you, you can actually register for an account um, for free. Uh, you can join the ABSO for a fee and become a member, but uh, they will let anybody register for an account so that you can enter observations into the database. Uh, so it does not hurt to do that. It's, it's kind of nice. And, uh, there's a lot of information on here. They have tutorials, they have charts, they have, you can do light curves, and I'll show you a bit of everything here. Um, we do have a bit of time. Uh, I'm not going to go too long here, but uh, I want to show you the important stuff and what you, need, what, what you can really get out of. First of all, I'm going to go to the Getting Started tab. So the two, four, six tab across the top, there's a section there on what are variable stars? They're pretty much teaching you what they are, kind of like I'm trying to give you a quick overview, things to do, uh, find a mentor, so they actually can line up mentors with you to help uh, uh, with doing it. But most importantly, what I want to show you is down at the bottom of that tab is the observing tutorials, 10 star tutorial visual observations of variable stars. Click on that, and it'll take us to another page. And this is about the 10 star tutorial. Um, they have two of them. Northern Hemisphere is the first one, and the 11 stars for the Southern Hemisphere is the second one multiple languages. Uh, the English version is, is the one you would want most likely. Um, or there might be some people who prefer the, the other the other languages. I, I don't know who's all watching or tuned in. So, uh, But it's a 10 star tutorial. Again, most of these stars I've just mentioned to you came off it. There's a list of the 10 of them. So Alpha Orion, Eta Germanorium, Beta and Gamma Cas, the Lyra stars, Mu Cepheus, the Alpha Cepheus, Delta Cephei, which is the one I did not mention, and of course Eta Aquarium, and the uh, Epsilon Auriga, and tells you the different seasons that they're, they're primed to be in, and uh, a few things about them. And you can click on the PDF, uh, and it'll just load up the PDF, and I'm just going to give you a quick uh, show of uh, what's in there. So there's a little bit of a background on what they are, why to do it, who's doing it, what a light curve is. We didn't, I didn't really mention that. Basically, if you plot all your observations of the stars, it varies uh, in magnitude on the uh, y-axis over time on the x-axis, you get a curve and shows you what the star has done. So that, that's your standard light curve. And I'll show you a little more of that in a minute when I show you how to generate a curve using your information. 
they do give a bit of background for beginners on how to use a star chart, just how to find things. And then of course, there's the all sky map that which is most of us have. If you don't have one, open up Sky News. There's one in Sky News. Um, and in the Observer's Handbook as well, the back of the Observer's Handbook has sky charts. And then of course, the, the few of the charts and the images I just showed you, how to use a star chart, how to make a brightness. And lastly, of course, there's, uh, there is a form, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. Uh, training. And lastly, of course, the charts that I was just showing. So by all means, if you want to get into doing observations of this, go get the tutorial. That's the best place to start, um, probably their tutorial. Uh, under observing, there's a whole lot of information there. Um, there's observing manuals, there's variable star charts. So you can go down here and you can click on variable star charts and you can generate a star chart for a variable star you want to, want to look at. I'm not going to do that today. It's a little more advanced than than looking at uh, the stars that we're using for beginners, which is the, t the, the 10 star tutorial. So I won't go into that. Um, what I do want to show you is how to report observations. So down here from, is the important link, the JD calculator and calendar, which is the Julian date calculator. Uh, we're going to need to know how to do that. And this other link, web obs, uh, search aid and submit your data. We will need that to submit data. Um, all the other tabs are for more advanced observing sections or different sections in the AVSO. Data is for if you want to pull data and create light curves or do research or science, there's a way that people do that. Variable stars tell you a bit about variable stars and uh, background. And then the community, of course, is about uh, the AVSO. So let's get into observing. Um, I actually made a couple observations of Betelgeuse over the last week, and I did not put them into the database yet. I've kept them knowing we were going to be doing this. So I'm going to show you how to make an observation. So my first observation that I have not reported yet was actually done on the 22nd of March, so a little over two weeks ago now. And I did it at 11 p.m. Uh, at night, my time, Atlantic Daylight Time. So I need to input that into the observation uh, database. Now, if you go to the web obs, you can find different ways to submit your data. There's submit observations individually, you can upload a pile of observations, you can download your observations, there's a whole bunch of things. All I'm caring about is submitting my observation. And I'm going to do it individually just because, just say I have one, that's all I need to do. I'm not going to get into the details of doing up a spreadsheet and sending in multiples. So under entering observations individually, it asks you what type of observation you're submitting. Click the down arrow, and what are you doing? Visual, CCD, photographic, DSLR, visual from a digital image. We're doing visual. I simply looked at the stars with my own eyes and said, how bright is it? So visual observations, and then you get a whole slew of things. Now, uh, one of the things I have in here is the UT time of observation in Julian date or year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds format. I find the easiest thing to do is enter the Julian date, but you need to know what that Julian date is. So I'm going to go back to that other tool for a second under observing, go to my Julian date calculator and start there. Uh, I always start there when I do observations because I know I need this. So what is the Julian date? Let's go look at that for a second about Julian dates and there's a whole slew of stuff in here but basically what it is is day zero began at noon on January 1st 471313 that is BC. So the Julian date is a running calendar of days um, from that time and date forward. So there's there's no two days on the calendar with the same number it just constantly keeps going. So January 1st of 2000 for example Julian date was 2451545, whereas January 1st of 1993, it was 2448989. So it's just constantly running from that date forward. I'm not going to get into the whole rest of this. If you want to go read it, you know where the link's at. Check it out. Uh, it's great. Again, what I want is the calculator. So I'm just going to back up to the calculator and go down to the second page here, or the second part of it. I don't know my Julian date. I want my Julian date. So I need to enter my time. So I was observing in 2020. I was observing March. And I said I made my observation on the 22nd, but that was local time. I need my time in universal time. So the 22nd, um, 
at 11 o'clock at night, so 23 hours, my time in Atlantic Canada, Atlantic Daylight Time, would have actually been the morning of the 23rd Universal Time. So I need to pick the 23rd, and if I was observing at 11 p.m. or 23 hours on the 22nd, I need to add three hours to get the daylight savings time. So I'm three hours behind UT. So I need to add three hours to get to universal time. So 23 of my time would be 02 hours universal time. And I did it at the top of the hour, so zero minutes, zero seconds. So my observation on March 22nd locally was actually March 23rd at two o'clock universal time. Make sense? Any questions? All right. Just hit convert. And there it goes. Top left corner spits out my Julian date for that date and time for where I, when I was observing. I can copy that, select it, copy, and I can back up, go back to my observing web ops, and then I would submit my observation individually. Again, I would do my Julian date before I did this the first time, so. There. So the first thing I know you notice when I'm logged in, which I am in the top right corner, you see it says hello Paul Gray, so I'm logged in, is it spits out my observer's code, GPMA. So your bunch of your initials put together is what they do. Uh, star identifier, you need to know which star you were looking at. I was looking at Betelgeuse, which is Alpha. So Alpha Orion, and it's just ORI, the abbreviation for the constellation. And every star on your chart will have that identifier name. So I looked at Alpha Orion and I go to my date and time of observations and I just paste my universal date, or sorry, my Julian date in there. My magnitude estimate at that time was 1.1. My comparison star would have been the 0 0.9 of Beetle of, uh, of uh, Aldebaran, sorry, and the, uh, I think it was the 1.6 of Capella. My chart ID, the chart doesn't have an ID because I'm using the 10 star tutorial, so I just write in 10 star tutorial. And then there's a bunch of codes. And I really don't need any of these because that night was a beautifully clear night. But if you want more help, you can click on more help and it will actually bring up a list of codes. So here's all your codes. So B, sky is bright, so you're still in twilight maybe. Or there was a, maybe there's an all sky aurora if we ever have that again. It would be nice to see. Uh, you could have light pollution if you're in the city, or they could just have a bright moon. You would be clouds, dust, smoke, haze. It happens. W is poor seeing conditions. Maybe you got one of those nights, everything is twinkling. The object was low in the sky. L, near the horizon, to obstructed. D is for unusual activity. Uh, fading flare behavior. This is an unusual activity of the star. The star appears to be doing something funny. Uh, it's going through changes quite quickly, for example. Outburst. Why? Maybe you're observing a, a, um, a recurrent nova or a, um, uh, there's another uh, short uh, type of novas. Um, I can't think of the name of them now. It's not a full blown nova, but it's like SS Cygni is a, uh, uh, a type of star that goes through four or five magnitude climbs uh, every, every few years. And it's considered kind of a nova, but it's not a full blown nova. Uh, I just can't think of the name of it right now. Somebody out there can text it in if it comes to their mind. Uh, K means you're not using an AVSO chart. Uh, comparison sequence problem or magnitude is uncertain. You're uncertain if you identified the right star would be I. And V, it's a faint star near the observing limit and you're only glimpsing it. So those are a bunch of the codes. And in my case, we had a beautiful clear night and I had no problems. So I don't need to highlight any of those codes. More comments, you can add comments if you want uh, to your observation that aren't covered by the codes. Normally, it's pretty straightforward. I fill out these first three sections in my comparison stars, the tutorial, and I think I've used the bright moon one a few times, and that is it. And Paul, then after all that, yes. before you submit, um, yes. the second comparison star, do you actually put the magnitude versus the actual name of the star in there? No, you just put the uh, comparison star brightness. Okay. Uh, quite you. often you're doing it from the chart, so I'm telling them what chart I'm on, and they huh. will they will go by the star that's on the chart because none of the stars on the chart have names, right? So you just estimate or you tell them which star on the chart you're using. All right. Thank you. Uh, so then you just hit submit, and you hope your internet stays connected, everything rolls, and boom. Oh, I 
Did I spell it wrong? Well, that's interesting. Did I put it in all caps? But I did. Alpha Orion. Do that again. 1.7.6.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
You can also see all the observers that have been included. And I won't be in this one because my observations were as far back as the 28th. So say I want to do it again and see my own. I can say plot another curve, same information. But let's go back 44 days. So from 900 to 944. Let's send. It's going to take a little longer now because it's pulling 44 days with the data from the database and plotting them all on the curve. There's all the visual observations. And you can see there is an upward, upward curve here. And again, you have second magnitude to 0.2 magnitude. And if you scroll down, you have all the observations, observers and all their observations. And what's really neat is you can find yourself. So there I am, Gray Hall, there you see. And you can actually click on yours. When you go back up, it'll highlight your observations with these symbols. And you can see how your data is fitting with everybody else's. It's kind of cool. There's one of my other observations way back there. And if you go, say, plot, let's go way back. Let's go back. Uh, when did this all start? October. So let's go back. Uh, let's go back 200 days. So 7, let's get 744. Hit send. So if you want to see what Beetlejuice has done this winter, this will give you an idea visually. And there's two really neat things to note here. One is the great drop. So Beetlejuice is hovering around 0.5 magnitude, 0.6 magnitude, which is where it normally sets. And then over December and January, it dropped down and averaged between 1.6 and 1.8. Um, so that's over magnitude, it's dropped over, over two months and it's quickly coming back. It actually appears to be climbing back a little quicker than it dropped, uh, which is kind of neat. But the other neat thing to see is how many more observations there are now. Um, every circle is an individual observation. All this block in here is multiple observations. And it's not so much that people were making more observations by themselves. There's more people observing it and recording it too. It's just they it gathered that much attention. Um, so I'm going to go in here and highlight mine again just to show you. And there's mine. And it says in this chart, I have 21 observations. So over that four months, I observed it 21 times. And you can see all my points scattered in there. And see where they're at. So that's how you can plot a light curve. So uh, I'm going to go back to the AVSO page briefly here, just to leave that up. And uh, we're at four minutes to four. So I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to do. I showed you how to observe a variable star, showed you some interesting ones to observe, and uh, hopefully showed you how to actually report your observations to the AVSO so that the data gets used and doesn't just sit in a logbook. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Well, one of the suggestions was that you could have shown Betelgeuse as well in, in the uh, start, the observation brightness. Sorry? Never mind. David had suggested you choose Betelgeuse. Uh, but there is another question. Can I use my already set up imaging rig DSLR for amateur photometry? How can I use my already set up? A light curve could be fun to make as long as the gear is already set up for imaging. You can use DSLRs for photometry or magnitude estimation. Um, I don't know all the details around it. I have not done it. But the AVSO does have, um, I remember reading it in here somewhere, under, where's the tutorials? Getting started. Uh, it's not under the tutorials. I think it's these two. There is a spot in here somewhere about using DSLRs and how to get them. Um, Dave Wayne, if you're out there listening, do you remember where that might be buried? And just so you know, I made a mistake. It wasn't suggesting the light curve for Betelgeuse. It was also suggesting you could type in Betelgeuse instead of Alpha Ori. You can, yes. Yeah, but but a lot of stars don't have common names to use. Mm. So that habit of learning the, the uh, designation for them is helpful as well. So, But the brighter stars like Betelgeuse and uh, Algol, for example, the ones with common names would have, uh, you would be able to do that. That's correct. 
if you just Google AAVSO and DSLR, yeah. it takes you to their guide. It's right. just a file somewhere on their thing, so I'm not sure how you get to it from the menus, but you can yeah, always there, Google it. There, there is a manual on the AVSO site for the DSLR. Actually, DSLR. Here we go. DSLR manual search. Uh, well, there it brings up the search here, but it is on the AVSO site. Uh, somewhere default, somewhere it's buried on there somewhere but there is a dslr manual for how to use your your dslr for doing uh doing curves as well or doing magnitude estimates for sure thank you paul i don't oh wait now yeah sorry yeah no i cut we, we caught the last question that was up there um, awesome so thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating today and presenting um, very interesting topics to us over the past three hours. Uh, I think it went well for our very first time, um, but we will certainly be in touch with folk and ask, perhaps ask uh, how it was from your perspective. One thing I would, uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention one special thing that's come up this past week. In Sky News for Photo of the Week, Blair McDonald's M42 was the featured photo. So yay, Blair! Yeah. Um, so we go on, on to the Sky News site and you can see Blair's phenomenal photograph. Um, and given we wish happy birthday to a couple of folk on, online today, happy birthday to all of those of you who are celebrating over the coming month. Our next webinar will be May 2nd, same time, same station. Uh, and we'll apprise everyone of how they can log on. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us and uh, we'll advise you when the, um, this presentation is on our Halifax Center uh, RASC YouTube site. So in the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and keep looking up.